All righty. So first of all, again, thanks, Alexi, for inviting me to, to, to talk about climate finance today and welcome everyone. Um, so what I want to do today is I want to give you a brief overview of this kind of uh, rapidly, the ex rapidly expanding field of finance called climate finance. And so this is going to be kind of an overview kind of uh, class. And as a motivation, I think, you know, more and more every day, I think there's more evidence that climate change is indeed an important economic risk that affects the global economy. And it's a risk that in many uh, dimensions is kind of different from the typical risks that financial markets have to manage, right? So, you know, obviously financial markets manage already a variety of different risks, you know, inflation risk, you know, market risk and currency risk. But climate risk is somewhat different. And one, you know, what, one of the things I want to do in this class is kind of think a bit deeper about what really is special about climate change as a risk and what makes it different from the other risks. So for example, it is a typically very long uh, horizon, right? So it's true that we see already some of the changes acting right now and some of the risk materializing right now, but we also believe that the worst risks are potentially occurring, you know, decades or, you know, potentially up to centuries from now. So the long-term horizon certainly makes it very different. The other kind of important element is the very high level of uncertainty about these risks. So many other risks, think about inflation risk, right? We have a lot of time series. It's a pretty high, relatively high frequency phenomenon, not as low frequency as climate change. So we can use very, uh, you know, very well uh, established statistical and economic tools to model the risks involved. With climate change, it's very difficult, right? It's, it's difficult because there's been basically a structural break, which is what happened when humans started, you know, uh, uh, much uh, industrial production. And um, uh, and so, you know, we've, we have, in a sense, very little data. It's very slow moving. The interaction with the climate, with, between the climate and the economy are not well understood. The dynamics of the climate are not well understood. And so because of all of this, there's a lot of uncertainty. And it, it's the kind of uncertainty we typically do not deal with in financial uh, markets, even though there's a part of finance that does deal with that. And so because of all this is a very different risk than other types of risk. Now, these first few slides, I want to kind of motivate why we're talking about climate and finance, okay? And I'll tell you what is kind of the, why, why this, I think, is a, is a useful question to think about is because if you think about where climate change is coming from, it's essentially coming from an externality, okay? It's coming from the fact that, you know, polluting productions, you know, the production and its pol uh, pollution, carbon emissions, right? That's what's driving the, uh, the, the, the change in the climate. Um, but this pollution is not internalized by the agent. If it was internalized by the agent, it would be much more likely that it would be a, a, a problem that the market can kind of solve on its own in some way. But because people will be internalizing the cost, right? But because these costs are not internalized, uh, there's an externality. And the point is, this looks like the kind of job that a government would do, right? You know, there's no, you know, there's, there's not very clear example why finance has a role to play. Uh, because if there is an externality, you, we, can, we, have, we know from economic theory, we have a bunch of tools we can use, like carbon taxes, for example, and we should just do that and, you know, solve the problem, right? Why, why is there a role for finance at all? And if I just to underscore this, as we'll see later, if you look at the very first models, the integrated climate and the economy, they didn't have any finance at all, okay? So what's the point of what, so what does finance have to do with all this? And I think what the, the reason why this field is expanding today in the way that it is, is that there's a modern view of this. And the modern view is that, in fact, financial markets and research in, in finance actually have kind of has two roles to play. There's an active role and a passive role. The active role is actually helping to address the climate problem, which I'm going to come to in a sec. And the passive role is very natural to us doing finance, which is, you know, it's, it has an important role in managing the research coming from the, from the climate. So even though, even if you think that climate actually has nothing that can do to actually change the path of the climate, well, at the very least, it's going to be still useful to manage the risk arising from that. So this kind of second role is pretty clear. I think what I want to emphasize for a second is why is there an active role in the first place? Why, why, don't, why doesn't policy simply address this issue with the tools that we have, like carbon tax? And there's many reasons why that's not possible. There's many political constraints. So in, in other words, there's essentially a lack in many countries in the world. There's a lot of lack of political appetite for carbon tax. There is a very, you know, there is a difficulty in having the international cooperation that is needed for a kind of political uh, solution. And so basically, the, my view of the, of the question is that the, we, we can't get to the first base. The first base is kind of impossible to get because of all these constraints. There are other secondary constraints. And for example, if you want to try to 
stimulate innovation, then um, you know you need expertise in selecting between different firms, right? Firms that are actually true good startups and firms that are like you know they're not uh, they're not good startups, and that's the kind of stuff the market's very good at doing, but the government is less good at doing in general. Uh, maybe we need some expertise that financial markets have in designing contracts to finance innovation and so on. So there is a bunch of reasons why the governments can't fully solve the issue. So we, for, for these reasons, we're not going to get to the first best. And so I think financial markets, my view of this is that financial markets have a role to play in getting to a second best solution. And we as researchers of financial markets can kind of help us understand what is the best of this known first best solution. How do we get to the second best, okay? So the second best solution is basically that many different sectors of the economy, not driven kind of top uh, down by the government, but kind of bottom up, they can each contribute in part to the, to the solution, okay? So going specifically to what the financial sector can actually do, there are, I think, three important roles that, uh, that they, they can provide. The first one is aggregation information, which, you know, we all know how it works in financial markets. In this context, you can think of it as basically like the pricing of climate risks. If these risks are correctly priced, then the economy can get a uh, an allocation, kind of go towards an allocation which you know which is um, better reflective of what the risks truly are, right? And this hopefully can kind of push the economy in the right direction. The second one is that it's kind of you can think of it as a corporate finance kind of aspect, which is that ultimately a lot of what financial markets do is to facilitate the transfer of funds. From you know, from the you know, from the savers to the users of capital, and if financial markets can help uh, move capital from polluting activities or polluting investments to sustainable investments, investments that promotes technological transition, then it can help kind of mitigate climate risk. And then there's a kind of more asset pricing kind of role, which is, as I mentioned before, managing and sharing climate risks. So these are actually. The, the separation between two and three is actually very analogous to the standard um, distinction that people make in climate science and climate change, which is between mitigation and adaptation. Mitigation means are those actions we do today to reduce the probability or change the path of the climate? Adaptation is, if you can't do that, basically is adapting to the damage of climate change. So these two financial markets play a role in both of these, of these uh, aspects of addressing climate risk. Okay, so this is just is an introduction to why you know in finance we're thinking about climate risk is because we think financial markets can be important. Okay. Now, in an ideal world, I would have much more time and I will tell you more about you know the entire thing, the entire I will discuss the entire field of climate finance. It's a huge topic. Uh, it's been growing very fast. And so I can cover it all in three hours. So my goal today is to uh, basically try to focus on one aspect, which is kind of more related to the macro finance side, which is how can the insights from asset pricing be applied to think about these topics? Okay, so I'm going to have an asset pricing perspective. Of course, it means I will leave out some topics. So, so I will leave out basically um, the corporate finance aspect of it, the impact finance aspect of it. I'm, gonna, uh, I'm not going to talk almost at all about household finance. Okay, and I'm not going to talk about technological innovation, which I think is really crucial in dealing with climate risk. And again, finance is technological, technological innovation. Is extremely important, and I'm not going to have time to go. Okay, so I'm going to talk more about the standard, more standard macro climate finance uh, issues. Okay, so that's the, the outline for today. Uh, I will do a very, very brief introduction to the science of climate change. Um, then I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on thinking of climate change as a risk factor. Okay, so I'm going to start from models, the model climate and the economy, and then I'm going to add finance to that. Okay. Uh, then I'm going to talk about the pricing of climate risk, which is, in a sense, is going to be an implication of those models. Those models say have, are going to have something to say about the uh, how investors in the economy should perceive climate risk and how they should uh, prices should react to that. And then I'm going to I'm going to ask how we as uh, investors can use all this information in the part above to hedge climate risk. And then I'm going to close with uh, a list of some avenues uh, for research and what uh, we still don't know, which is which is a lot. Okay. Stefano, can I ask yeah. you real quick, is there um, a relationship here with the ESG literature? Like, um, you know, there is something so, in common, but what's the overlap and what's not in the overlap? Okay, so the ESG literature is, uh, that, so there's a very big overlap essentially in these last two points here. And the ESG literature is basically 
it's really the form. Okay, so it, it, there's you can think of it the, the way that in the last decades we got a lot more data on activities of the firms that involve environmental concerns and social and uh, and governance concerns. So there's been an increase in the in the data availability, and this has basically led the industry to really push to make investment using this information. Right. So ESG investing is basically investing based on this additional information, a lot of which relates to the climate, like you know carbon emissions. Okay. So the ESG literature in finance has basically focused on, in a sense, the invest the investment problem, and it has focused on the price of this is because now we have all these new characteristics, and they have looked and the literature has looked at basically the price of these different characteristics. Uh, in very often it has worked with reduced formality. Let's say extensions of the CAPM, they think about the investors that are care about these characteristics. So the link there is that many of these characteristics you can think of them as proxy for climate exposures. So much of the, the S and the G basically will be kind of very different from what we're doing here, but the E, all the, the investment uh, literature about the E of the ESG investing is another way to say, well, we're going to take these characteristics as betas, basically, as climate betas. So I'm going to come back to that a little bit because when we're, when we're going to do, for example, hedging, it's going to be very natural to try to build climate portfolios using these characteristics. So hopefully I'm going to cover that later. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay. So this is going to be very brief. I, I assume that most of you have a little bit of a sense of how climate change works. So I'm going to be very brief. Uh, the idea is that there's a cycle, okay? There's economic activity, which we typically study in isolation in our macro models, right? And then what uh, the, the, the idea of the climate economics literature is that based on this economic activity, has been known for a century at least to affect the climate. And then the climate is basically a long-term phenomenon, but that has manifestations that are weather related, like you know, hurricanes and wildfires and, and things like that, and, and floods. And these actually have very direct damages on uh, human activity. So there's a direct, so typically the, the way that we think about capturing the long-term trend in the climate is by the raising temperature, the increasing temperatures. This happens over very long horizons. As it happens, it has both direct effect on human activity because you know if the temperature grows a lot, the kind of crops that can grow, for example, change. But also there's a weather implication. The weather is kind of a more tangible, a more immediate, uh, visible damage from climate change. Okay, and so there's this cycle. Okay, which is human activity produces climate change, and climate change affects economic activity. And all the models we're going to talk about today, they're going to have some version of this cycle. And uh, specifically, uh, what, I, what, I, what, what we kind of mean when we try to measure climate change is basically captured by one summary statistic, which is the increase in temperature. Okay, so there's several summary statistics, but this is a kind of one of them. You can see this is the temperature, uh, the, the, um, is the temperature since 1860. You can see it was kind of pretty much stable. Of course, there's kind of seasonal fluctuations, uh, but there's this kind of, there's been big, this big increase in the last, uh, in the last 50 years to 100 years. And then uh, similarly, the temperatures of the oceans, okay? These are the temperatures for a year, right? In different seasons. And you can see that this, we've been pushing up and up and up over the last, uh, over the last decades, okay? And uh, why is this happening? Is because there's a higher concentration in the atmosphere of some particular gases that basically, they're called greenhouse gases. The most important of which is carbon dioxide that basically retain some of the heat that comes from the sun, okay? So basically, this is probably the most striking graph to me. This is the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last million years, okay? Million years is a pretty long time. And you can see that over a, this very long time, there are kind of very low frequency fluctuations, right? They span maybe 50,000 years or so, okay? But then there was a big break, right? And the big break happens, you know, at zero is basically the last 100 years, right? Since the Industrial Revolution, we had this big increase in this concentration that was way, way above what happened before. And part of the problem is that, you know, if you look historically, you can say, okay, look, what happened, you know, what happened when there is an increase in, the, in carbon dioxide? Well, temperature tends to increase in a correlated way, but we have never seen an increase like this. So it's kind of very hard to know, you know, what should we expect in terms of temperatures? Uh, with such an increase in, in carbon dioxide because we have not experienced this before, okay? So part of the uncertainty is that we are really in new, there's a structural break, we're in a completely 
uncharted territory. So there's only so much we can learn from the past, which is why we're going to need to rely on models, which is why there's a lot of uncertainty. Okay. Um, now, I just want to give you some sense of what the projections are going forward. Okay. So uh, the difficulty is I'm going to kind of remark in other times today of making projections that you cannot make projections of the climate on its own, right? Because the climate is affected by human activity. So when you make projections, you need to make projections that are conditional on the response of the economy to the climate. Okay. So I cannot tell you what's going to happen. In the, I cannot make even a forecast for what, what's going to happen in the next hundred years. I can make a forecast that says if we keep polluting at the same at the same uh, uh, at the same uh, rate, we're going to get to this scenario, right? If we keep, you know, we start tightening a little bit the production, we get to this scenario. So this projection that people are making, right? This is this is a, a chart. Okay, of carbon emissions. So this is the flow, okay, per year from uh, 2020, uh, from 1990 to today, right? These are the different uh, projections. The different projections are conditional on what are we expecting to do. So this policies and action projection says, well, what if we uh, kind of keep emitting, not like we used to do, because governments are already reacting, but kind of in the way that people seem to be reacting right now. Okay, so this is not, this kind of business as usual. Is not we're going to keep polluting like we used to do 30 years ago. Is we're going to keep what seems to be the current policy. Then you can say, okay, what if we have kind of people really, what if governments really follow all the pledges they make? What if we kind of get lucky and they really do a little more? What if they really cut very drastically? Okay. So you can see that, you know, the more, the more you tighten the policy, sorry, the more you tighten the policy, the more emissions will flow down. But the point I want to emphasize today is that. This, the end of the graph here tells you what temperatures are we going to increase, are we going to hit? Okay, so these temperatures are relative to the pre industrial times. Okay, so yeah, I remember when people were talking about this 20 years ago, they were saying, Oh, you know, we should try to stay within the one and a half degree above pre industrial time increasing temperature. Well, that's already out of the wind. Okay, why? Because you can see that we can get to one and a half degrees above pre industrial times only. If we kind of start cutting emit emissions very, very quickly, and that's not going to happen. Okay. So, one part of the, what, what's kind of really dramatic about this, this, this topic is that there's no question that at least some of the climate is here to, some of this climate change is here to stay. There's no way we're going to reverse in any kind of short run what has happened unless there's some sort of massive technological innovation that allows us to cheaply remove gases from the atmosphere or some other geoengineering, which I'm not going to have time to talk about today. What does it matter from a finance perspective is that we're not in the condition to say, well, if we do enough, we're going to eliminate all the risks, right? Even if we do a lot, we're going to get some risks. And the risks are there because the weather is changing, because some of these temperatures increases are in reverse. Okay. So that's why I think finance still is going to have an important role to play, no matter how much we're going to do in terms of uh, mitigation. Stefano, there's uh, one question in the chat. I think it's on the previous slide. I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, Young Chin, do you want to answer your question? Uh, yes, thank you. So uh, exactly. So I'm thinking why there's the seems like a cycles on the temperature. Oh, that is just you know the, these are the kind of long term geological change in the climate. I don't, I don't exactly know why, but there, there are these kind of long term patterns that happen. Uh, you see. know, everything in the in the planet changes slowly, right? Like the I don't know the um, there, there's various kind of long term geological uh, changes that I I don't know in detail because I'm not a climate scientist. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, climate disasters, okay? So um, the, as I said before, there's a difference between climate and weather. And in a sense, what we care about here in this class is about the climate, okay? But um, uh, the, the, the climate is basically the long-term change in the, in the, in the, in the, in the weather. And you can think of the long-term shock to the weather, whereas the weather is called the, the, you know, the high-frequency fluctuation. The damages are actually mostly gonna come from the weather, for the, with the exception of the change in the sea level, uh, the level of the seas, okay, which is going to have a long, is going to happen much more in longer scales, and it's going to uh, have a potentially very big effect on the farm. Okay, so what are the kind of uh, damages that we think the physical damage we think are going to come from climate change? There are rising sea levels, there are uh, increasing hurricanes. That's not entirely clear, but certainly increasing strength of hurricanes. There are or wildfire threats. There are potential pandemics because the climate changing changes the composition of the 
uh, of the ecosystem. They can change different pathogens that, are, that, uh, that arise in the economy, in the in the system, in the ecosystem. And then uh, there could be, for example, migration. Okay, which are, could, could have potentially large social uh, economic effects. Okay, so these are the kind of damages we're going to think about today when we're going to think about climate damages. Okay, just to give you one example. Okay, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but just to give you one example. This is a, a projection. This, this is a change in, project, in projection about um, the areas of near Shanghai, which is going to be submerged by, uh, by, uh, 20, by 2050 at high tide. Okay, As we learn more about the climate and we understand better what path we're in, uh, we're going to um, we're gonna update our views. Okay, And so this is kind of the, if you want, you can think of this as the area at risk of flood if uh, this scenario actually materialize. Okay. Okay. So what's the summary? This is a very brief summary. Okay. So uh, there is there has been a clearly human driven increase in carbon emissions that have led to increasing temperatures. Okay. There's some of this irreversible, which is going to make the uh, you know it's going to produce risks that are kind of not entirely avoidable, even if we actually start cutting emissions quickly. Uh, we're gonna have temp uh, they we're gonna have you know physical damages through weather patterns and sea level uh, rises, and uh, I do want to emphasize that a lot of this is actually unknown. Okay, so you know these are all projections, but there's a lot we don't know. We don't know exactly what is the climate gonna happen. So what's gonna happen to the climate? One example of that is that um, one example of that is that there are gonna be it's possible, it's likely, there are, there are going to be what so-called tipping points, so, so that basically once the temperature reaches a certain, uh, a certain level, there's going to be some acceleration of, the, of this change. For example, because you know, the ice caps are going to melt, and there's going to, there's going to uh, push more water in the oceans, and it can, it's going to reduce how much light is reflected, and so on. So there, are going to be, there could be some acceleration happening at some point. We don't know when that point is going to be. We don't know what is the kind of the critical point where that's going to happen. We don't know what, what's going to happen after we cross that point, for example. So there's a lot of the path of the climate that we don't know. Of course, we don't know what happens to the economy, right? That's we are used to kind of deal with that. We don't know the many of the parameters of these models. We don't even know what the models are the right model. So there's a huge amount of uncertainty, and we are going to deal with that uh, today. Okay. So. Let's go to the economics of all this. So I'm going to start with thinking about climate change, the macroeconomy, and uh, asset pricing. And I'm going to start without any finance. Okay, just to give you a bit of the history of this, uh, this field of macro uh, of macro and climate was pioneered by by Nordhaus, uh, which basically started in the 90s writing these models uh, of uh, so-called integrated assessment models, which integrate both the climate and the macroeconomy. Okay. So think of them basically in the language of macro as a big structural model, where in addition to your productive activity, you also have the, the climate. Okay, and this model started very simple, and they've been evolving, becoming much, much more complicated because computational power has increased. That typically solved numerically, anyways. Okay, so now they're very rich. They try to be very rich in the way they model the climate dynamics. They try to be very rich in the way they model the economy, and they try to be very rich about the interactions. Okay, so they become potentially very large. Um, and but the, but the idea is very simple, okay? The idea is you have a standard kind of production uh, model, right? And in this production, uh, part of the production, there's an emission. The emission affects the temperature. The temperature ultimately affects climate change, which ultimately feeds back into the economy, okay? Now, if you think about the original goal of these papers, it was on um, on optimal policy, okay? What is uh, basically the question was. Given this situation, what is the optimal path of production and emissions that maximizes wealth, right? So these models, obviously, you know, we are economists. We don't say we should cut emission to zero today because we still need to survive and eat and everything, right? So there's going to be some balance between uh, consuming and product producing and polluting, right? That takes into account the internalizing externality, right? Because we have a welfare, we have a, we're trying to find optimal policy with welfare criterion, right? And so it's going to be basically all about the balance in some sense between smoothing out consumption and smoothing out the damages from climate change. What I want to note here is that the original models actually didn't have any risk at all. They were deterministic models, OK? So the DICE model is a deterministic model. I'm going to give you one, just I'm not going to go into all the details of the equation, OK? But we're going to give a flavor of the 2023 version of the DICE model, OK? 
uh, DICE is dynamic integrated model of climate in the economy. Okay, that's the Norgos model. There are many variations. Okay, I'm just going to give you kind of the benchmark version of today's of DICE because that still doesn't include any, any risk. Okay, so to give a sense, that's a, a family of models, then they did not reach to add risk. Okay, but I want to start with a model that didn't have at all the, the, the risk component. And then I'm going to tell you later why I think introducing risk is important. So Stefano, just really briefly, is, is part of the assumption here in these models that there's no independent sort of like ethical, you know, uh, value on the environment? We're, we're just kind of putting everything through the lens of what it will do to GDP. That's correct. Um, the, 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 there is, so there's no inherent value of the environment. It's only about consumption. Mm -hmm. But there is, uh, the, there is um, the, the only ethical part, the only ethical kind of, concern that comes in these models is uh, is through the discounting effect, okay, which we'll talk about a little bit, you know, which is really about intergenerational kind of fairness as opposed to purely about the environment. There are other models where, where there is kind of environment in the utility function, yeah. but here environment really is coming, is environment is just, it needs to be part of the, of the consumption bundle, but it's not explicitly said that way. Okay. I mean, you can reinterpret some of that because you see, the, as you'll see in one second, mm -hmm. you're going to have the weather damages, the climate damages are going to be like a tax on consumption, okay. right? So you can think of that as basically you, you like to enjoy this when they disappear, you know, you're going to get a reduction of your consumption. So formally speaking, there's nothing like that. There's no like direct utility out of the environment, but, the, you know, it's kind of difficult. You, you can write a model which is very similar to this one that includes that. You're, you're, you're saying that it's, almost without loss of generality, assuming that you take it properly into account through consumption, you don't- Right, because, exactly, it. because these models are not that quantitative at the end of the day on the economic side. You know, they're not that rich on the economic side. So okay, you could you could think of, I mean, I, I this is my just speculation, okay? But I think you could just take the consumption bundle and split it into the environment and non-environment part. Mm -hmm. And then the climate change would be basically destroying part of the environmental part. And then it's kind of akin to the tax on consumption that you see here, okay? Yeah. But it, this might be wrong, okay? So I, I maybe I just take away. You just parameterize it maybe differently. Right, exactly. exactly. I think is exactly the process. For right. That. I got you. Thanks. So to be clear, it's not like, you know, these models are then actually matched to actual consumption because they are most used for like policy evaluation. We don't really know what consumption is going to be anyway mm -hmm. in the future, right? So, mm -hmm. okay. So uh, I'm going to give you, I'm not going to go through all the equations. I'm going to give you the main because of the big picture view of these models, okay? So the objective function is based on the utility of a uh, of an infinitely live or a finitely live investor, a uh, consumer. Uh, the consumes so a consumption bundle C, and L is just population growth here, okay? And you can see there's a standard CRA utility. You can you should think of this phi as EIS, right? Because there's no risk in this model, so. Uh, and then you have a standard Time, con time discount factor is the only discount factor you have here, which is which is wrong. Okay. Now, if you import one important thing here is that this row, right, is in is based on the rate of social time preference. Okay. So that doesn't need to be the private time preference. So if what I'm saying is that is why I'm saying this is because many of the topics that we we'll talk about when we think about risk, which is you know different, we might want to use different discount rates. This row is the channel where you can do it here. So if you want a low discount rate. You will make an argument to say, well, it's really very valuable. You know, I really, uh, you know, for whatever reason, I really care about this, this mitigation uh, investment. I'm going to choose a very low row. And you could say, well, I can justify it as a social planner because I really care about future generations. So any discounting effects, anything you think should go through discounting factors needs to go through row, basically. Okay. Or the growth rate of the economy, which you're not going to talk about right now. Okay. So, you can see the consumption side is kind of standard, okay? And then the production side is also kind of standard, right? There's a usual production function, but um, you are gonna have two additional effects, okay? One is that you might sacrifice some consumption, some of the output for mitigation, okay? So how does mitigation work, okay? This lambda T is what we call, what they call abatement cost, okay? And the abatement cost is basically investment you do today to reduce, uh, to reduce emission tomorrow. Okay, so you, get, you could decide basically in your economy to sacrifice some of the output for mitigation. And then these omega are the damages. The damages are kind of the ultimate, the ultimate effect of this feedback loop. You know, you, you have the climate, the climate feedback into the economy, it taxes your output every, every period. Okay, and you can see that these, uh, these 
damage function is a function of temperature, right? So there's going to be a climate side of the economy or of the system. This climate side is driving temperatures around. And when temperatures are particularly high, you see there's a quadratic function here. The, uh, the damages will hit your, uh, your, your production, OK? And really, the optimal problem here would be a balance between how much damage I'm able to accept today and tomorrow, and how much instead I want to kind of uh, uh, mitigate through this uh, abatement and how much I want to consume. Okay, so these are kind of the control, the control value. Um, and then uh, you have standard kind of uh, you know standard equations for the economic system, and you have basically emissions. Emissions they are they are driven sorry, they are driven by output. Okay, so you produce, output produces emissions. Emissions will induce change in the temperatures, and temperatures will feed back into the, the economy by essentially like a tax on production. Okay. Now, uh, the what is missing here, right? What of these pieces I did not tell you is the link between the emissions and the temperatures, right? Because I told you how the how the production affects emissions. I told you how the temperatures affect production. I didn't tell you the link between emissions and temperatures, okay? That's the set of equations, which I'm not gonna go through, okay? So this is the climate part of the system. The climate part of the system was take care of telling us if you meet more, you meet in this particular sequence, how do temperatures evolve, okay? There's all this climate science that I'm not gonna go through that determines uh, all these, these changes, okay? So this is the climate part of the, of the model, okay? This is kind of how the model works. What is the outcome of the model? The, outcome, the model can be used in two ways. It can be used to tell us what's the optimal policy. Okay, how much should we tax today uh, con a production, right? How much should we pay in terms of mitigation cost today versus how much should we wait and pay the, the damages tomorrow? It can also be used for policy evaluation. It can tell us, um, it can tell us if uh, you know, if you keep following this policy, for example, you don't tax uh, at all, what's going to happen? Okay, so that's kind of the point of the model. And what does the model generate? The model can generate basically projections. Okay, it can generate projections according to uh, whether, for example, you follow the optimal path. It tells you, look, if you optimize uh, your your emissions, then you're going to follow this path. That's what's going to happen to temperature. That's what's going to happen to consumption, and so on. So these is, are the path, the optimal paths for, so, sorry, not the optimal paths. There are some paths of, uh, CO, uh, of CO2 concentration and global temperature according to different projections, okay? Let me give you some examples, okay? So this CB optimal is the path according to the optimal policy, okay? This deep blue line here, and here this light blue line. So you can see that in this model, okay, the optimal path actually has a pretty significant increase in concentrations of CO2 and a pretty significant increase in, in emissions. Okay, now what drives that? Why is it the case? It's because in this model, the, uh, the effective discount rate is actually pretty high. Okay, in other words, why it's pretty high is because basically, think about the, the standard equation in the standard macro model. What are the equations that determine the free rate, right? There's the intertemporal preferences, and there is the growth rate of consumption, okay? So depending on the calibration you have of basically what the average growth path of the economy is, the EIS and the, um, and the time, uh, time discount factor, then you get very different scenarios. And the calibration that Nordhaus has is a discount rate for this, uh, for basically a discount rate factor of about 4%, uh, which means that you're gonna have, um, you're, you're gonna accept basically quite a bit of damage in the future because you really care about the present. If you lower the discount rate, for example, you have this uh, discount rate of 2%, which is this blue line here and light blue line here, you can see you go on a much more moderate path, okay? Now, I'm not going to take a stand now on what's the right discount rate because I actually personally don't think that this is the right framework to think about discount rate. I don't think that the discount rate should be thought about in a framework where we don't think about risk at all, okay? Maybe it reflects my finance bias. And so I think that a big contribution of of, of having climate finance is precisely that it makes us think carefully about what this country should be, okay? But this is the introduction, so it doesn't have any, any climate finance, and then any finance. And then the other thing I wanna point out that is there's this concept in climate, in climate economics of the social cost of carbon, okay? Formally speaking, that's basically the, way, the economic cost 
of one more unit of emission, typically is one ton of carbon dioxide, in today's consumption unit. So you the numerator is today's consumption. Okay. You can basically think as the as the benefit of mitigating from by one unit of ton. Okay. What is the present value or the benefits that arise if you mitigate by one ton? And again, this social cost of carbon will be pretty small if you have high discount rate because the benefits are going to come in the future. You're discounting them a lot. And so you're going to have very little benefits. Okay. So this is the calibration for the social cost of carbon that Nordhaus does. Okay. You can see that in his optimal scenario, uh, the social, but this also has dynamics, but it's focused on today's social cost of carbon. That's about $50 per ton of CO2. By today's views, that's considered a pretty low number. Okay. By, it, by the way, that's also the carbon tax you want to put, right? If there's no internalization of this, of this, of this cost of pollution, right? Then you want to put the carbon tax equal to the marginal uh, cost that you're imposing on society, which is exactly the social cost of carbon. Nowadays, this fifty dollars is actually considered a pretty low, uh, a pretty low, um, a pretty low number. But you can see that as you, as you decrease the discount rate, it can it, it can become really really high. And in fact, today the, the the preferred numbers are certainly above a hundred. In the market for carbon uh, uh, for carbon emissions in Europe, the price is above a hundred, right? So it seems like the economy has been moving to using a higher cost of carbon, which is compatible with basically lower lower discount rates. Okay. Can you comment on why it's so nonlinear? Like, especially going from two degrees to one and a half, like it just looks like is is blows is because, up. Yeah, is because basically the cost of of that going down those those path becomes kind of very very sharp. So basically, to go from two degrees to one and a half degrees, uh, those those were there was not this conference. Those that you're referring to, yeah, those were, uh, yeah. They were the target set temperatures, but the target temperatures to get from one from two to one point five, you need to cut so much more dramatically. There okay. is a huge cost. So basically, you know, in other words, to get there, you need to tax production a lot. Mm. That's the idea. So that's where the nonlinearity comes from. Okay. Yes, and now, and then the nonlinearity with respect to these countries is just because, you, as you know, these countries are in the denominator. Yeah. The there. Yeah. Great. Okay. So. I've been speaking for 40 minutes and there's been no finance. So let's go to finance. Um, why is finance important? Is because I think that this view that, that we should be basically setting these optimal policies, ignoring risk, is uh, missing an important piece. And this is not obviously my take. This goes back all the way to Weizmann, who's really pioneering this. And the idea is obviously very simple that if we think the climate damages are correlated with margin utility, it really changes the value of mitigation. And it changes the optimal policy. Okay. And I think that all the, the best way to think about this really in terms of these countries, right? That the only way you can capture, so if you think that there's risk that matters for these policy decisions, it will matter to these countries, right? Dice models don't have a path, don't have a parameter to choose for that. So the only way you can kind of arbitrarily change the this country, okay? Finance gives you a good re, a good kind of thought process to think about the right discount rate should be, okay? So that's what most of this kind of climate finance macro literature has been focused on, and I'm gonna focus on this today. Questions? Okay. So, okay, so why, what does asset pricing has a role to say about climate finance? Let me just review quickly. So first of all, asset pricing cares about risk, but it also cares about intertemporal preferences, right? That's part of asset pricing. And because climate change operates along horizons, right? Uh, I think understanding intertemporal preferences, not just for smoothing consumption, but also for different risk across horizon is important. As I said before, it's an important risk to the economy. This value of, of the social cost of carbon is essential evaluation problem, right? Ask us what's the present value of removing a, uh, a unit of, of, uh, of emissions today? Of course, that's evaluation problem, right? We are discounting future benefits. We need to think about the discount factor. Um, managing climate risk through portfolio strategies is what basically, as we talked about before the ESG, uh, the ESG uh, literature, that's what the industry is trying to do, right? It's trying to, in a way or another, do portfolio tilts that kind of hedge investors from climate risks. And um, we can learn uh, from, and, and then there's an, there's an information problem. So when I said before that from financial markets, you can learn important information, here's an example, right? If we can read 
the appropriate risk countries in from financial markets, which is something we typically do in finance, then we can use them for the optimal policy instead of getting numbers kind of arbitrary. Okay, so I'm going to use the social uh, cost of carbon as a guidance. Okay, as a kind of guiding kind of light through what I'm going to say, but you'll see that what I'm going to say is kind of more giant, just really how how we build this this uh, these models. Okay, so a little bit of review of general discounting theory, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, but I'm going to review quickly. Suppose that you have a mitigation project that will pay benefits at some horizon t plus n. Okay, how much should you be willing to pay for that? Well, you do a present value calculation, right? So you're going to choose some discount rate R bar uh, that is appropriate for that investment, right? This is an investment only pays at the time horizon. And so there's, you, know, you just pick some discount rate R bar. That should incorporate a bunch of things your time preferences, expected growth, the, maybe ethical concerns of the future generations, and of course, also risk. Okay, so the way to think about that in, from a finance perspective is that, in a sense, this discount factor is not really a primitive, right? The stochastic discount factor is the primitive. And once you know the stochastic discount factor, you can discount any cash flows and you can find the right price, and therefore, you know the right, the right discount. I mean, they're obviously then equivalent one to the other. So it's, it's not really a very meaningful distinction, but it's useful to, to, to think about the following, right? That if you have a, a cash flow that is uncorrelated with the stochastic discount factor, right? Which is your marginal utility in that state uh, or in that period, right? Then you should be discounting cash flows that is free rate, right? If instead it's, uh, it's correlated, then you should ask for a risk premium. And there is premium because we are compounding for so many periods could actually make a very big difference in terms of the present value of these investments. So, uh, okay, so then when you think about climate risk, it just in the same way that in, in finance, we think about beta with respect to the market and other things. Here we think about climate beta, okay? Which is the correlation between climate damages and the state of the world. So I'm gonna say, it's gonna sound kind of weird for those of you that come from finance but basically if you think that climate damages are high in good times then mitigation investments are actually risky right because climate change so if climate damages are high in good times when you mitigate climate change you're reducing the damages actually happening in good times where your marginal utility is low you don't really care that much about that okay and so mitigation investments in this scenario actually would be discounted at a high rate certainly above the risk free rate okay I mean, at least to me, it sounds kind of weird, but that's, that's just the math, okay? We'll talk about a little bit about the, the, what this means. The maybe more natural scenario is when climate, when climate damages are high in bad times, because for example, there's a climate disaster that affects the economy, then when you mitigate this, this, uh, this climate damages, when you do mitigation investment, that's, kind of like, that's like a hedge, right? So it pays off in bad times, or it helps reduce the probability of something bad happening, where your marginal utility is high, and so that gets a risk premium, which is below the risk free rate. Okay. Something which is kind of trivial, but amazingly is ignored in the literature sometimes is that climate mitigation investments basically have the negative of the correlation of the damages with the SDF. So if damages have a certain correlation, a certain risk premium, then a mitigation will have exactly the opposite sign in terms of risk premium. Okay. So this looks all very abstract, right? Is any kind of natural they should be? one or two explanations. Well, it's not so natural. So think about the dice model that we saw before. Now, the dice model has no shocks, right? It's a deterministic model. So this kind of be hard to think about risk. But now imagine that you just add uncertainty about the path of the economy. Okay? You know, there's, there's you know, think about long-term growth, right? Long-term growth is kind of shocks to the trends of the economy. And maybe, you know, maybe 100 years from now, we'll all be extremely rich. And maybe some, you know, 100 years from now, there's going to be maybe some nuclear war and we are going to be all, you know, living in poverty. And so we're not going to meet anything anyway. So the logical the DICE model says that basically if you add uncertainty about the path of the economy, when are we really going to get the most damage out of climate change? Well, if the economy keeps doing well and we keep growing and because we keep growing, we keep emitting and then we're really making a lot of damage to the climate and then we're going to pay the price, but we're going to be rich then. If the economy does badly, and we're going to be all poor in the long run, right? They were not going to produce, they were going to emit anyways, and the climate would be much less of a concern. So in this scenario, actually climate mitigation investments 
are going to get a high discount rate. They're going to be risky because ultimately you only care about the, the climate in good time. Okay. Now, this doesn't look, doesn't sound natural. It's probably, it's, I mean, it's certainly effective. It's mathematically there. Okay. Uh, the, I think that the, the asset pricing literature is more concerned with either long term shocks to consumption or disaster shocks to consumption that are caused by climate change. Which is going to have the reverse implication, okay? But certainly, any shocks to the economy will have this effect of making climate mitigations uh, project risk. And I'm saying all this simply because, in fact, as of today, there is not even agreement of whether this, you know, we think of mitigation as being high or low base in the literature. So it's still an open question because it really depends on the model you're using. Okay, Stefano, just uh, two small things. So it, it also seems. In addition to the point you just made about the climate disasters, it's again a case where if you did have like independent concern for the environment, that would also push you toward what sounds like the intuitive case that uh, the climate change is associated with bad times, like high marginal utility. That's, uh, that's right. And you could put it through consumption, just like you said, it would kind of push in that direction. I think yeah, I think you're right. And then and then what's the equilibrium effect? It will depend on, on the parameterization of the model. Okay. And the, the second thing I want to ask is that climate block that you kind of, you know, didn't really go through the details of it, but that one didn't have any uncertainty either, right? Like not, no. it, it seems like so, that yeah, should yeah. also so have way, a lot of uncertainty and be risky yes. and so on. Are, are you changing that too, or just the econo economic block? Okay. So here in this one last bullet point, I was just thinking about the, uh, the economic block, just adding a process to consumption. Now, Uncertainty is very difficult to deal with in these models in a fully, let's say, in a in, in a fully general equilibrium way in the following sense. Right? If you if you were to, if I asked you, add uncertainty to this model, what would you do? You would say, well, now there's a parameter we don't know, right? Or maybe the piece of the model we don't understand. And then you would have the agents think about, okay, but I don't know this. Then I'm gonna uh, then incorporate that into my optimal behavior, right? That, as you can imagine, is going to be very tricky, right? Very hard to do to solve fully for the model. So what what typically uh, many uh, of these applications do deal with uncertainty is that they incorporate uncertainty with parameters. They make many runs of the model, basically they run many paths for different starting points and for different values of the parameters and get a distribution of potential paths. But the point is that this uncertainty is very often not incorporating the decision. Yeah, yeah. Okay, the discounting, right? Correct, and so that's what part of the uh, of the literature in finance is trying to do. Okay, to incorporate this ambiguity, and, you know, and your preference for this ambiguity about the right model, in including the about the climate block, not just like including the about exactly including about the climate block. Correct. Uh, so Lars has been working on this topic. For example, I'm going to mention this briefly later. Okay. Okay. Thanks. This is just to say that even the climate. Even figuring out what's the, what's the climate data is actually a tricky question, okay? So Weizmann uh, was really a pioneer uh, about thinking of taking a risk approach to climate finance. And he had the following intuition, which, you know, I think by now, you know, is completely standard. And, you know, not so much time has passed, right, since he was writing about this. That basically, rather than thinking of climate fund as a consequence of the path to the economy, right, we should think of climate as a source of risk. In particular, he had in mind the disaster view, right? Due to these tipping points, right? The economy will kind of slowly trend up with the temperature. Uh, and then, you know, at some point we reach a critical point where everything will unravel and we're going to have really bad damages where maybe we're going to have really devastation in the economy. So formally, he was thinking of modeling this as a rare disaster. And this is just a quote from one of his papers. Uh, spending money now to slow global warming should not be conceptualized primarily as being about optimal consumption smoothing, so much as an issue about how much insurance to buy to offset the small chance of a ruinous catastrophe. Okay, so that thing summarizes well his view. So he wrote a paper on this, and it's a bit more complicated than I, than I want to do in a slide. So Baro is kind of a version of his disaster model, which incorporates this insight. So you can think of this as a Weizmann idea into a Barrow disaster risk model. Where you basically have this, you know, the, 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 the production for the output process has a standard normal shock, but also a disaster shock. Disaster shock could be like a war, right? A standard kind of disaster shock. Oopsie. But then it could also be, sorry, it could also be um, the climate disaster, which is kind of exogenous here. Exogenous coming so with a certain rate. And then the, the rate is affected by, um, 
by a probability which is driven by by alpha. Okay, so he also incorporates this feedback effect, and uh, um, basically you can mitigate this, right? So that's endogeneity. You can you can pay to mitigate the the probability of disaster, right? By sacrificing some alpha. Okay, so it's a very simple model that allows to think about one dimension of optimal policy, which is basically how much I wanna how much I want to uh, to mitigate, right? But this is gonna be driven. But the, the optimal policy here is going to be driven by the fact that this climate disaster is the main source of risk for the economy. Okay. And so just like Nordhaus, he, he gets a bunch of calibrations. Okay. I don't have them here, but you can see where this is going, right? So just to, to summarize, in this model, investors are really, really worried about disasters because they, they, you know, disaster brings you to a very steep part of your of your utility curve, right? And so you're very averse to that, right? Just in a standard disaster model. And so that gives very large incentive to uh, to uh, to mitigate, and that's equivalent to say that when the consumer thinks about these mitigation investments, they apply a very low discount rate because climate investments they pay very highly, right? They they have a very high effect in those states of the world where you otherwise have very high margin utility, right? Which is when the disaster strikes because you're changing probably the distribution of the disaster, and therefore you get very low discount rates. Okay, so I think the low, if you if you if you know the, the barrel model, the standard rare disaster model, this is kind of pretty clear, right? The disaster is is a resource, it's very painful for the consumer because the consumer has curved utility, and and so you're willing to pay a lot to mitigate the disaster. It's just a transposition of this idea where the source of the disaster is the cloud. Question on this? Okay. So this is kind of the finance aspect of of this of this world and then and there's been many models based on this so um you know i'm not going to go into the details of many models but basically start so there's been there's been the the macro climate view of north house there's been the finance view of north house and there's been a process of integration of these two over the last decades okay so there's many people that are working the interaction of the two they're trying to incorporate insights from the finance literature into this uh in, into these uh, climate models. Okay, I'm not gonna go there because it's a too big literature for me to review this just to give a flavor of the main uh, the main inputs here. Instead, I wanna talk a bit about horizons because I work myself on this topic about uh, horizon. I think it's particularly important for climate change. Okay, and here's the, here's the idea that if we live in a CAPM world or a consumption CAPM, right? Typically, or, or the barrel model, is basically a certain, it's almost like a static model, right? In the campaign, it's exactly a static model where you, in the consumption campaign, it's also a static model. You only really think one period ahead, right? So you really have one beta for every asset. An asset is a high beta with climate or a low beta with climate. But working as a pricing theory and empirics has emphasized that, you know, in a dynamic world, the riskiness of the investment might actually be different across horizons. And also the preferences for risk might be different across horizons. Okay. And so, um, so specifically, if you think about an investment with a certain stream of dividends, right? And I ask you, how should you discount this investment, right? That's kind of an IRR question, right? So I, I give you this is the price, these are the dividends. You can back out the discount rate if you know the price, or you can say, what's the correct discount rate for this kind of investment? So you, you can get, for example, the CAPM implied discount rate, right? You get the beta, you get the, the discount rate, you apply the same discount rate to every rise, and you get the price. That's a totally valid exercise. Whether you have dynamic views or not, you can always say, I think that this is the right discount rate for this investment, and I'm going to apply it. But you can also view this investment as one of those strips, right? You could say, well, this investment pays this much at this horizon, this much at this horizon. So if you think of this as a, as a bundle of strips, then the price you want to pay for the, for the bundle is the sum of the prices that you pay for each, for each piece, okay? Uh, and so if you think of that way, then you can say, well, maybe I want to value different pieces separate, right? For each piece, I'm going to have the discount rate is appropriate for that particular price. So I'm going to have an R bar I. Okay. Now, how do you make the two 
So both views of the world are completely feasible. Right? I could decide one rate. I could decide this period specific rate. They kind of need to give me the same answer. So they need to satisfy an equation that tells me that whether I, I choose one way to approach the problem or the other, I kind of need to go back to the same valuation. Okay. Uh, and so what is the, so is there any reason to choose one way versus the other way to, uh, to think about the problem? Okay. So uh, here's the way I think about that. Okay. Which is that if I know the entire time structure of these countries, R1, R2, and so on, I can not only value this particular investment, but I can, I can value any investment which is a different composition of this cash. Okay. So suppose, that, for example, I have, a, I have a certain machine, and this machine has a life of, of, of 10 periods. If I know the value of that machine and I know the entire set of these countries for every period, I know the correct value, of the correct price for that machine. But I can also do the hypothetical that says, what if I build a different machine that only pays the last cash flow? Well, then I know how to value this. But if I only know the average this country, which is appropriate for the entire machine, right, the entire bundle of strips, then I don't know how to value the strip that relates to the exactly the right, the last cash flow. Okay. So why I think this is important is because for many climate mitigation investments, these tend to be quite different in terms of their maturity structure than the investments we typically have. Right, the stock market has a certain duration. Right, the stock market pays dividends every period. They're very, you know, it pays two or three percent every period, more or less, with some fluctuations. But a climate mitigation investment has probably very little benefits in, in the short term and many benefits down the long term. So it's particularly important for us to understand how should discount those very last cash flows. So it's particularly important to focus to have some sense of whether these long term these countries might be very different from climate discounting from the very short term cash flow. Okay. So we're kind of lucky that there's been work over the last decades in asset pricing, exactly thinking about how do we learn about these different these countries over short term and long term periods, and then going to try to link them to the climate. So that's the goal for the next few slides. Let me stop for one second. Any questions so far? Okay. Good. So before we go to some more structural work, uh, the discount rate to apply to a specific project then depends on the following, depends on the climate beta, whether dividends, mitigation benefits, you can think, are paid in good or best state of the world, and that horizon. Okay, so you can think of the maturity specific beta. It also depends on people's preference. So you're all familiar with, I don't know, the consumption of and you're all familiar with long-run risk model. These models have different implications for what kind of risk I care about. Okay, if I'm a long, you know, if I'm a kind of Epstein Zinc kind of investor with certain parameterizations, I am really worried about long-term growth to the economy. If I'm a standard kind of, you know, CRA cons a consumer, I don't care in a sense about long-term growth to the economy. I care about the immediate short-term growth to the economy. And so, obviously. When we think about the right discounter for climate mitigation, it needs to be a combination of the quantity of risk and the price of risk at that horizon. Okay, so we can use insights from asset price and try to get to this question. The final point that I think is very important is that I don't think we have much hope to be able to directly read climate specific mitigation investment discounters from the data, right? Maybe at some point we're going to have enough the data that we observe about actual investment in climate mitigation. We can say, look, if I want to do a new investment, I can take the same discount rate the investors have applied to that existing investment, right? Kind of like how many firms do valuation, right? They say, look, I'm, I'm doing an investment which looks very similar to, let's say, IBM's risk profile. I'm going to use, let's say, the CAPM to figure out the uh, the expect the discount rate for this investment using the beta of IBM. Right, there's, there's like a comparables approach. For climate mitigation, we don't have much comparables to use. Okay, when we go to the data, we're not actually gonna see a lot of data on term structures of climate mitigation investments. But maybe if we're lucky, we can find some other things, other term structures, and then we can use models to uh, to join the two. Okay, so why models are useful is the following. I can write down a model, like maybe the Barrow model or, a, or an Epstein's inversion of that or something like that. And 
these models are or a dice model or something like that, right? Dice model with risk. I can take these models, and these models are gonna are gonna model both the economy and the climate and investor preferences, and I can use existing data on term structures to calibrate these models, and then I these models will have implication for the term structure of these countries for the climate. Okay, so that's that's kind of the mental process they have. We observe some term structures. These term structures are very different than what we should apply to climate because they're not about climate. They're not about mitigation in the climate. They're maybe about housing, maybe about volatility, other stuff. But we can use them to calibrate our models, and you can use then the models to say something about the term structure of these countries for the mitigations you actually care about. Is this kind of are these steps clear? I was just gonna ask, and maybe there are other questions. Um is this assuming that there's no separate like climate factor that is just that is somehow that is not spanned by the factors that we have like something uh, uh, that like a so it's okay so there are two possibilities either there's a common factor which is uh so if the common factor is, is is kind of at least partly unspent then obviously there's an entire part that you don't know and you need to calibrate right it's also possible that the climate factor in some sense maybe is part, right? Maybe the climate affects the market. And so your market beta kind of fully captures that part. But you still need to understand the, you still need to understand uh, how, you need to still understand the beta of your investments with respect to the market, right? So if you have a new mitigation investment, you need to figure out what is the beta of that investment with respect to the market. And if that, if that goes through the, the climate path, you still need to understand that piece of the of the of the equation. Yeah. Is it clear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like it could be span, you it could be that basically your climate beta is correlated with your market beta, but you need to quantify that. Even yeah, if it's it, fully span. It, it's natural in these models you're presenting. It, it, it again it goes through consumption. And so that's exactly exactly perfect. That's yes. the idea. Yeah. That's exactly so in some sense, if you have a consumption claim in these models, it like in the bottom model, in a sense it fully spans. Mm -hmm. the, the, it doesn't actually fully span the climate because consumption is driven by many things, but it spans really the only thing you care about, right? right. Which is so, consumption. So you can't necessarily be purely reduced form asset pricing, you know, where you would just say, well, you know, price of risk could be anything. Instead, you're kind of putting in more structure with the fully specified consumption model and, 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 okay. and that gives you what, what it must exactly. be. So that is my view. That is my view of what is needed. And I'm going to make this remark both now that I'm talking about structural models and also later when I talk about the reduced form evidence. Mm. Basically, there's it's much harder to write climate models than it is to do reduced form empirical work. But this reduced form empirical work, as, as you all know, but reduced form empirical work really has a very big limitation in how much you can go to the fundamentals of what we care about, like these climate betas, the price of climate risk, and so on. Okay, So it can give us directional, directional indications. It can give us a sign. But really understanding the, the magnitudes of this, you, I don't think you really can do much without actually going to the model. I remark that because I try to make a connection later with the empirical work. Sounds good. Okay. So then what the, that's just to sum up, what can the model give us? It can tell us what's the karma beta of some asset, right? Once you model the asset, it can tell us what, how much investors care about these risks at different horizons, and therefore what are the implications, the welfare implications of different policies taking into account that investor time preference and risk preference. Okay. So I tried to write down one of these models. It's very far from perfect, okay? Uh, but, and it's much, much simpler than one of these dice models, okay? And so you, this is not the kind of model I would say is kind of right to be really quantified, okay? Even though I tried, it's more a like qualitative kind of structure model. It's a proof of concept, but I think, I think that illustrates this idea, okay? Uh, and uh, the idea is exactly to say, I'm going to write one of these models of the economy and the climate, and then I'm going to try to calibrate using this term structure of these countries on risky assets they observe, and then I'm going to try to make implication about mitigation investment. Okay. The key here is that these term structure of these countries are not climate related. So maybe you, uh, so the, uh, the term structure that we use here is the real estate term structure. It's nature. Uh, to use, I think, in climate change because real estate, by its job, because it's a very tight, obviously, to location, it is kind of directly exposed to climate risk in a way that other entities we typically look at are not, right? For example, you look at a firm, a firm might be currently located in New Haven, which is exposed to, cl to climate risk, but it could be relocated, 
right? But the house, which is located on the beach here in New Haven, is probably much harder to relocate. Okay, so I think real estate is a good uh, is a good asset class to look at, but it's not a mitigation investment. Okay, so we're going to look at real estate, try to calibrate the process for rents and the relation to the climate and and so on, and then try to make some impl implication about the value of mitigation. So, uh, let me review first where do we get this transaction data. This is an old paper that worked with uh, Matteo and Johannes uh, many years ago. We actually, at the time, we actually had in mind as one of the uses of this structure, the climate, uh, the climate problem. We didn't make the link in that paper. We made the link in the, in, in the following paper. So the idea is very simple. How do we get information about the structure of these countries in the housing market? Uh, is because the, of some quirk in the UK and Singapore housing markets in which you can basically buy uh, you can uh, you can buy a house forever like you do in the US that's called the freehold or you can buy a house for a limited amount of time which is called the leasehold okay so the idea is that if uh, you know if I buy the house for let's say only 100 years at the end of 100 years I don't have the house if I buy the freehold at the end of the 100 years I have the house and so the difference in price between the freehold and 100 year leasehold, what is that? Is the present value of actually having the house in 100 years. Okay, so it's literally the present value of a cash flow that happens in 100 years. It's a risky cash flow, it's not a mitigation cash flow, right? It's a risky cash flow, it's exposed to climate risk because housing is exposed to climate risk. In the data, we actually measured in this paper, we measured the discounts for leaseholds of different maturity, okay? So this is, for example, leases with 80 to 99 years remaining. This is a discount relative to the freehold in lock points, okay? So it tells us basically, the le in the UK, leaseholds with about 80 to 99 years remaining, they have about 15% discount compared to the freeholds. Leaseholds with about 100 to 125 years remaining have about 10% discount respect to the leaseholds. So the people are saying, for me, I'm willing to pay 10% more to buy freehold than I am to buy, to buy the leasehold because I value having this, this house 100 years from now, okay? You can then translate this into a discount rate. What, the, this, what is the implied discount rate so that a payment of the house 100 years from now has a 10% value today? Well, you can do a cal the calibration and you get about 2.5% in the long term, okay? So they basically... In these markets, the implied discount rates for this horizon is two and a half percent. The so you can think of a low kind of long-term discount rate. On average, the discount rate for the housing market was, is about six percent. So that has to imply that the short-term discount rate must be pretty high. Okay, so this is for a risky asset. This is a risky asset which you can think of it as having a large premium in the short term and a small premium for the long term. Okay. Stephen, so, is anyone, I've, I, I remember this paper well, it's such a great paper, and I'm sure there's a lot of follow-up work, and I'm wondering, has anybody looked at areas that might be more exposed to, to, to climate versus less and try to use this idea to yeah, so we get actually, even closer yeah, to Yeah, we tried. We tried when we wrote this paper a long time ago. Oh, okay. We tried to compute, the, so in the UK, we tried to compute the, uh, the difference in this discount across areas that are more exposed geographically to climate risk, like coastal areas and not, mm. we can't find any, any effect because the, the standards become much wider once we have to cut down the data. Mm -hmm. so, um, so we can't find any significant difference. In UK, it's all in the UK, I guess. So it's not yeah, the, we are UK. variation in the exposure perhaps, or I don't know. So that's where. what we did. But Singapore, Singapore is even less exposed because it's a much smaller place. Mm -hmm. so it's much less, there's much less variation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you know, we didn't, we, we, try, we thought about that. We didn't find really anything, but it's also possible that, you know, we tried, you know, it was probably, you know, 10 years ago now, right? So maybe things have changed now. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good point. Um, okay. So uh, now how do we link this to the climate? Okay. So the starting point here is the standard long-run risk models don't generate a decline to start to risk assets, right? If you if you have tried to if you work in your classes on with a longer risk model, for example, it implies an increase in the structure of this country for a risky asset, right? If you're really worried about the long term, you really don't like risky asset in the long term, right? This is saying something about preferences. It's saying that 
or about risk, right? The ESA are saying that housing, long-term housing in these countries are not, don't carry very large risk premium because either people don't care about the long-term risks or they don't perceive the long-term quantity of risk to be particularly high, okay? So this is just one input, right? It's just one extra input in calibrating models. What we have done in the follow-up paper is we built a model that features climate disaster, standard power utility, and adaptation. Okay, so in our world, the explanation, or in our model, the explanation for why housing, which is a risky asset, gets you low discounted for the long term, you know that people don't care about the long term, but it's because basically climate risk is a, is a disaster risk, and after the disaster hits, there's going to be some, you know, the economy will kind of grow back. And there's going to be adaptation, and this adaptation helps mitigate the risk in the long term. So, as an investor in, in housing, I'm really very scared about the short-term consequences of cloud risk, which are these big disasters. I'm not that worried about 100 years from now because I know that in 100 years we're going to adapt. You know, we're going to build seawalls, we're going to find new agricultural technologies, and so on. Okay, this is one calibration. Okay, given the fiscal bunch of moments that we give, of course, there will be other calibrations that might meet, meet they might they might uh, hit some of these moments or, 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 or others, okay? But our calibration is, is meant to, to explain, you know, the average equity premium, the average housing premium, the long-term discount rating housing, and so on. So what is the model? The model is actually very simple, okay? It's, I'm gonna just give you the first, a few equations, okay? Just to give a flavor of the model again. So this the economic side of the, of the model has consumption growth is driven by a, trend, right? Like in the, in the long risk models and disaster shock, right? This J is when disaster hits, it, it destroys consumption today. Okay, this XT tells you how fast consumption grows back, right? The, in the absence of disaster or after disaster hits, how fast does consumption grow? Well, that's driven by the second equation that is itself also driven by the disaster, okay? The key, okay, to all this is that, um, is this five parameter, okay? So this five parameter tells you whether when disaster hits, does it also make the economy grow lower than usual? That is have no effect on the economic growth or does it kind of make the economy catch up? To mesh the housing infrastructure data, we need this five coefficient to be positive, which is a recovery after disaster, okay? So when there's a disaster, the economy drops. They say the economy is growing 2% per year, disaster hits, but then the economy will at least partly catch up. So there's gonna be a period where the economy will be, will be growing faster, you can think of the reconstruction period, faster than 2%, and then it's gonna slowly go revert back to 2%, okay? Why do we need this? Because otherwise you don't generate uh, the decline infrastructure in the housing term period, this country, okay? And housing rents or dividends, they have follow the same process, okay? So, this is the economic side, okay? So the, the disaster is the climate disaster. That's the only risk in this economy. Like in the barrel model, there's, we ignore the normal risk, which is irrelevant. So there is only disaster risk. And then later on, we add, uh, and then we add the part of the climate. So how the climate evolved? Well, we model the probability of disaster as being driven by economic growth, okay? So higher economic growth uh, means higher growth uh, in, the, in the probability of disaster which is you, you can think is a kind of a very reduced form way to capture the feedback loop on climate change. And then we're gonna have a, the disaster occurrence that um, the disaster occurrence that can excite more, more disaster, okay? So to give you a sense of what are the kind of paths that this model can generate, okay? So this is, you can, this first graph is a probability of disaster as deviations from the trend from long run mean. And this is the growth rate of the economy. So the economy was growing at a certain rate. Then for if for whatever reason, the economy was growing faster than usual, then the probability of disaster would increase, right? Due to certain effects. And then slowly go back to trends. And then if there is a disaster, consumption drops and then kind of starts growing. You see a little bit faster. So in the long run, it catches up. And then, you know, this is when the disaster occurs and then probability kind of goes back down. Okay. So again, this is not meant to be realistic, okay? So if you want to be realistic, what you would do, you take the dice model or something with all these much more complicated climate dynamics and you would insert these considerations and do a numerical exercise, okay? This is just meant to say that you can take these, these models and add a transstructural component and learn something about what the dynamics of the economy should be. 
Yeah, I just wanted to ask, maybe this is what you're referring to now. Can we think of this disaster as a climate disaster? Could this be like the melting of the Greenland ice sheet? That's the way that we are thinking. That be something right. Okay. So one thing will be as a tipping point, correct? Okay. So so but rather than like putting it into the climate block, it's it's you know, we're kind of putting it into the the consumption. That is that the idea? So I think that uh, no, so I would say I would say that you know, like in every model. There's going to be some basic damage from the climate. Everyone, yeah. that, right? So yeah. the, it's in the dice model, it's in the barrel model, right? If the question is how you model the disaster risk and how you the, the disaster dynamics link mm -hmm. to the climate. So the, all these models basically have something like. So in the dice model, this damage is deterministic, right? In the barrel Weizmann model, is a disaster shock, mm -hmm. but it's still a disaster. Is still a, a hit to consumption, and then the climate block basically tells you how this disaster probability or how the climate damages functions that are driven by the, by the, by the climate. Yeah. So that's what the, 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 the dynamic of the, 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 the climate dynamics part is. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we don't view, so then what we do, we, we have scenario utility. As I say, we, in, in our model, housing is less risky in the long term, not because people don't care about long-term risk, but because it's this, this kind of resiliency due to adaptation. And then we calibrate to you know the term structure of these countries and housing market, term structure of risk, real risk free asset, and then some version of the elasticity of house price to climate risk, which is a climate beta, okay, which is much harder to measure. Okay. And then we obtain implication about the term structure of these countries for climate mitigation. Okay. So I'm not gonna go through the entire calibration process. You should read the paper and write me if you have questions, but I hope you get the, the picture idea, right? They were trying to calibrate these parameters. To match distant structures and the average this country is equity premium and so on. And uh and uh and some of them is easier than other things. Okay, so gonna come later to what are easy and difficult to match to the aggregate to the macro models. Um yeah, we, we have a question in the chat if you want to take it now. If sure. time. Meha, do you want to ask your question? Uh yeah, sure. I actually just wanted to ask how do you consider insurance in this setting because it's such an important um, element for the housing markets in general especially in the areas where there's more climate exposure okay that's a fantastic question so really this is an aggregate risk right and so there's no insurance that can happen in a sense at aggregate level i mean that's basically the only thing you can do is mitigate yeah. the risk right so the insurance market is entirely shut off here because it's not heterogeneity right so in the real world, what, what is the role of climate insurance, which we're going to talk about later in the class, as you see, we're going to cover a lot of topics today. What's the role of climate insurance really is transfer of risk between households, right? Between all different, different people, right? It could be across countries. There are countries that are more affected. They're going to sell insurance to countries that are, sorry, they're going to buy insurance for countries that are less affected or households in the coast. They might buy insurance from the government, right? They're basically buying insurance from people who are less affected. Right, or they're more able to tolerate this risk. So insurance is really with an aggregate risk is really risk transfer. Okay, so it plays no role in this particular model. It obviously plays a huge role in the real world, right? For many things, it plays a huge role for incentives. It plays a huge role for allocation, right? Because if you have a, if you're perfectly insured, for example, by the government, you have the ins your incentive to keep building in in the risky areas, right? So this is more like a micro view. Of, uh, of how to manage this risk than a macro view. We're going to get there because the second part of today's class will be exactly about this micro view. Okay, so I'm going to come back to, I'm going to come back to in short. Uh, Stefano, can I ask just one more thing? Um, yeah. You know, part of what you're saying is that to, to match the, the pricing that we see, there has to be this kind of mitigation or that's one of the ways to generate it. And I'm just worried, wondering, uh, could it, be that people are essentially assuming that that the government or what the policymakers will kind of solve the problem, and this is why it's uh, priced this possible. way. But if the government also kind of assumed that by looking at the prices, then it would be a problem, right? So absolutely a similar yeah. thing in in banking where we say, well, why doesn't what maybe regulators should just look at CDS spreads on banks? But right. the CDS spreads might be low not because the banks are in good shape, but because they're soon going to be bailed out. So I'm just wondering yeah. how to solve that. Um, I think you're exactly right. I think that's current. certainly something that could be going on. So. Uh, it's something that we don't model because we have a very simple model, but there, this is an important issue, I think, 
the relation with basically the implicit insurance coming from the government. And this kind of links with what we just talked about now with this, the, the effect on moral hazard and incentives of any of these insurance. The insurance could be just on the, the, you know, the standard moral hazard with private insurance. There's even more if it's insurance where you don't internalize the cost, which is because it goes through the government because you're basically taxing everybody else through that. Um, and it can absolutely distort allocation and it can absolutely distort prices. That's a very good point. Yeah. Uh, I don't think that anybody's looked at, at this effect in the macro sense, at least. I think in this, you know, this the, looking at insurance has been it's been done in the in the micro kind of studies, but I don't think in the macro climate studies. Yeah. Okay, great. So maybe I can uh, finish with this model and then we can take a break. Uh, so I just want to give you basically a little bit of a sense of what the output of this model is. Okay, so the output of this model is the following. Well, one of the outputs, okay? So first of all, this is the estimated structure of these countries from housing, okay? Or a parameterized version of that, okay? So you see housing is a risky asset. It's exposed to climate risk. So uh, it has a very high discount rate, 10% at the short term, low discount rate, like two or 3% at the long term. Here we're talking about very long horizons, okay? Now, the risk-free asset in this economy is basically flat, which is what we kind of see in the about 1%, right? Which is matched to calibrate the transactional discount rates of interest rates on that we see for the first small piece of the curve. Of course, we don't see these countries for a thousand years. And then what are the lessons from all this modeling? So one very simple lesson, which is trivial, right? Is that this blue line that we estimate kind of has to be an upper bound. For the discount rate, you want to apply to anything which is mitigated. Right? If you remember the conversation before, I told you, look, Nordau's kind of dice model is implying this country about like four or five percent. Well, that's out. If you if it's out even just from this upper bound, right? It's above this upper bound. We should not be using for climate mitigation investments anything above 2.5%. What's the reasoning? This 2.5% is a discount rate to apply to risky investments. The risk free rate has to be below that. And the mitigation investment has to be below the risk-free rate. So this is kind of a pretty wide upper bound for the discount rate to apply to mitigation investment. That's what you can say without doing much work as long as you assume the housing is risky with respect to climate change. More interesting, the model gives you some calibrations for different um, for different climate mitigation investments. So you can say, what if I do an investment that is able to mitigate one tenth of the damages? For the climate, well, this is the discount rate to that for that investment. Okay. What if I want I want more mitigation? Then this is the discount rate. Of course, this is all dependent on the exact way you model the mitigation process, right? How exactly it affects the cash flows from the climate change, but it's it's one uh, one exercise. And to be clear, this is all margin. Okay. This is saying you know it's basically saying if I if I do a, if I invest a little bit of money into this mitigation uh, investment, you know, what's, what's the marginal price of that, okay? So it's a marginal concept. Uh, but at least, you know, you can see what, what happens here is that it doesn't have very long, very big effects on the long term, but it has very big effects on the short term because here people are mostly worried about the short term, okay? And again, this is not to say that this model should be taken quantitatively very seriously. It's just to, to kind of to, to, to show that you can take this data from the housing term structures or other term structure like, the people have discovered in the literature and then add them to this kind of to this kind of model. Okay. So maybe I'm gonna stop here because uh because we it's been already quite a bit of material. Maybe take a 15 minutes break. Yes. Sounds and then good. come back. And I'm gonna go and then get coffee, but soon I'll be back. So if you so collect your question during these 15 minutes and then afterwards we awesome. Go Let's come back then at 1040 Eastern. Sound good? Thanks, guys. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we'll pick up. Um, I see there's a question in the chat. Borald, would you like to jump in and ask your question? Yes, sure. So I was wondering, in your calibration and simulation here, we have very low, I mean, discount rate for climate mitigation, mitigating project, and even zero. I was wondering, in your mind, I know that you said it was still qualitative, right? But does it mean that those projects have to be subsidized at some at the beginning? What are the implications for markets? 
Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, there's nothing really particularly weird about uh, about negative discount rates. I mean, uh, basically, when you buy insurance, you're buying a negative investment product, negative uh, discount rate product, right? Like you buy the iPod insurance, but maybe the iPod is not produced anymore, maybe the iPhone insurance, and uh, you pay a ton of money and you most likely don't get it back, right? That's a neg- You don't expect to make it, you expect to lose money on that, right? Your house fire insurance also expect to lose money on average. And that's the negative discount rate uh, product. So that all said, just basically the negative discount rate just means that you're going to pay a lot more than you're not buying the investment because you're going to make money. You're buying the investment because you're, you're paying high enough that you think you're going to lose money, but you're still happy to buy it because it's mitigating this risk. So that's, that's all it means. It means higher price, basically. Kind of uh, related to that, is there, is there a, a way to think about when exactly you should you should do the mitigation like should you wait and do it when you okay or, or before how should we think about the dynamics of that yes, yes yes so this is something that we didn't uh so we didn't do that at all okay because we didn't think at all about the uh the uh the optimal mitigation we just said we're going we, we use the model just to evaluate different mitigation um properties different, different mitigation investments but most of the literature in this space does actually exactly that. It tells you exactly what is the right path, right? Because there's, you know, some of you want to do today, some of you want to do tomorrow, right? And then, you know, there's very, there's also richer models, for example, they have, you know, learning by waiting, right? There's some uncertainty, you can wait, you can learn more, right? So you don't want to do too much mitigation at the beginning, because if you wait, you might have better targeted mitigation, for example. So these dynamics of, um, of mitigation are very important, and they're explored in many models. We don't do it here, but they are very important. Okay, great. So we're done. Oops. Ah, so yes, I, I in fact, there was one more thing I wanted to mention, which is there is uh, in finance, there has been this uh, literature on uncertainty and ambiguity, basically with the typical uh, distinction that risk is kind of the uncertainty I have within a model, right? I have known probability of uncertain outcomes. There's ambiguity, which is, relates to uncertainty across models, in the sense that I have many possibilities and I want to think about different weights across these models and I have some preferences. There might be, you know, I might want to kind of, uh, you know, just average our models, or maybe I want to penalize the worst model. You know, there's different preferences with respect to ambiguity. And then you can also add to this model in specification. Maybe I don't even know what are the flows the model is having approximating the truth, all right? So there's many layers of trying to think formally about what we don't know. And in an ideal world, right, we, when we think about the optimal path of the economy and valuations, you should take this, this uncertainty into account. If people really hate uncertainty, and you're in a case where you're in a framework where there is in a context with the result of uncertainty, that should affect valuations as well, right? An incentive to, to mitigate, for example. Right? If you think, for example, if you have a preference that there is really a threat of really worst case models, and you have a model under which climate scenarios really can really devastate the economy with very high likelihood, then you might have even more incentive to invest in mitigation. Okay. Now, this has been explored by a, 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 a kind of a, a piece of the literature. Uh, Mike Barnett and Lars Arsene have a bunch of papers on this uh, using the smooth ambiguity framework, which is a decision theory framework of how to deal with ambiguity, how to model formal ambiguity version. Uh, I actually personally think it's very crucial. Uh, unfortunately, it's kind of not very easy to work with these models. Right? They, the math just gets more complicated, and it gets very complicated to quantify that because we don't have that much information about what are the models people are considering and how do we calibrate those models and so on. So I think the state, the the the, the goal. I think I'm gonna I have I'm gonna talk about about this again at the very end. I think this is one of the most important areas to work on in climate finance to make these uh, these relatively complicated models about how to think about uncertainty more tractable and make them more quantitative, okay? There's a lot of work, very important work to be done here because I think it really is crucial for thinking about uh, climate change. That said, I couldn't find a way to bring you the formalities without taking too much time. So I'm going to move forward, but you know, the fact that it's only spent one slide is not an indication that, that you know, we solved the issue. We are just at the beginning of this issue. Okay, so this so far you can think of it as kind of the macro side of the climate finance uh, challenge, and now I'm gonna go to the more micro side. 
and then I'm gonna try to connect the two, okay? So uh, the more micro side is really about the pricing of these risks. And it's basically saying, look, the, all these macro finance climate models had the implication that assets with different climate betas, they should get different risk premium, right? It's true if you simulate the models, you get you produce different assets with different climate betas, they're gonna have different risk premium. So um, it's very hard to actually go and find direct evidence of this kind of prediction in the aggregate data, right? In other words, another way to think about that is that you could say, well, maybe the market has become, you know, over time as climate risk became more important, maybe the market risk premium reflects some of that, but go and distinguish that from all the million different drivers of, of aggregate risk premium. So it's just very difficult to do identification in, in a time series, basically. And instead, what we can do is uh, we can say, well, maybe we can check the uh, cross-section implications in terms of beta and in terms of risk premium. Okay, this has been the biggest part of this climate finance literature over the last decade. Okay, now it's a little more micro than you know. Where at the end of the day, it's a macro finance society, not a micro finance society. So you know, I don't want to go too micro. So I'm going to give you a flavor of this, and I, but I want to actually mostly try to think about how do we connect these micro estimates with the macro, with the macro results. Okay, so. Uh, and especially what, what's missing link, okay? Why, why, are, why are these literature so disconnected so far, okay? So uh, what are we trying to study empirically when we look at the micro pricing of climate risk? We're typically trying to distinguish between the pricing of transition risks, which is the, the risk arising from transition to a sustainable economy could be because the government, you think the government is gonna impose a carbon tax. So if you're an oil company, uh, or, or you know, maybe a car company is producing kind of very polluting vehicles. You think you're going to suffer from that. If you're a solar panel company, you might benefit from that, right? And so there's some risks which are aggregate risks, but they're they're due to the government response to climate change. And this is distinct from the physical risk due to different exposure, which is, for example, what could happen to the car, to the housing market, right? Which is affected by flood. So the, this literature has been separate, okay, simply because Different asset classes are differentially exposed to the two. Some asset classes may be more exposed to physical risk, and other asset classes may be more exposed to transition risk. So let me start with transition risk. The, 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 let me say, before even I get into the details, how do this entire literature proceed, right? So how do we learn about the pricing of a risk in financial markets? We do two things. The first thing is we compute the beta, right? We say, look, I can measure the risk, Right? I can measure the price of the asset and I first ask, is it true that when the risk materializes, the price of the asset moves? Right? If this beta is zero, but you think the fundamentals are affected, that means the financial markets are not even considering this risk in their valuation. Okay? So that's why I'm calling the beta version of the price of current risk. So this, the, and this is one version that is different from what other people call the price of current risk, which instead saying, if conditional there being a beta, so condition on the fact that I find assets whose prices in fact move a lot, move in a certain direction or move in a different direction with climate risk. So condition on the pricing affecting the beta, do investors require risk premium associated with this beta, okay? The second layer of pricing of climate risk is about how much compensation for risk people want for this beta. It's conditional on the fact that there is a beta in the first place, right? So these are two different questions that are very often confused. So I would encourage you to really think when you're asking about this question, when you read papers about this, to think about you know, which of these two questions is, um, is investigated, okay? Because some papers do one, some papers do the other. Some papers, they go and measure the beta and, and focus on the beta question. Some papers, they take as given the beta. They say, well, I'm gonna assume that this particular firm is more exposed to this risk. And then they measure the risk premium, okay? These are different questions. In some sense, the uh, I personally see, I, I feel this is my very personal view, okay, which differs from the view of other people. I think we're not yet, we are making progress on the beta question of whether in fact financial markets are responding, are responding to, to climate risks. That's a question that we can, I think, answer pretty well, at least in a qualitative sense. Why? Because even though we don't have a lot of data, we have, you know, betas can be estimated even with pretty short time series. 
I think the problem of getting to the risk premium question is that the, the markets didn't really price in the beta aspect of this until pretty recently. You're left with like 10 years of data. And my personal view is 10 years of data is not enough to estimate risk premium. Okay, so I'm going to show you studies that have done both. I've never done myself because I find it not entirely convincing to go to the risk premium aspect. Okay, but there are different views. And so I'm going to, I'm going to just present all the results that are in the literature. Okay, but remember when people talk about pricing of climate risk, they could mean two things. They could mean I'm going to check if prices move when there's risk information or I'm going to mean the risk premium. Okay, with that in mind, let's talk about transition risk. Okay, so transition risk is uh, is basically, as, as I said, the measure of the risk coming from the transition to a sustainable economy. And basically, you can think of as a first proxy, some exposure to the fact that one day the government will, will wake up and impose some sort of carbon tax. It's extremely likely, and I think everybody's view, that this climate issue will ever be solved without passing through that at some point. So either a carbon tax or a cap and trade system. Of some sort. And so in the case, who's going to suffer the most is going to be firms that emit a lot of carbon, right? And so I think these papers, they are trying to basically measure directly carbon exposure or exposure to carbon risk, to, to carbon tax risk, and then may trying to measure the risk premium. So they're, taking, they're going to take as given that the carbon emission of a firm is going to be a good proxy for the beta. That's the link with the ESG question that, that Alexi asked before. Okay, so carbon emission is one of these ESG criteria. We're going to basically assume we can check in some sense, but we're going to assume or check that it is a good proxy for a climate beta, and then we're going to check, use that to construct the carbon uh, risk premium. So I give you two examples. One is uh, of a paper by Bolton Kaspersik, and what they do is basically literally take a, a very large data set on carbon emission firms and they, they ask, a very simple question, which is, are carbon intensive firms cheap? In other words, is the discount rates associated with these firms large, right? That's one implication that comes from these models of uh, these macro models, which is if you're exposed to climate risk, you should get a risk premium, okay? They use, they look at both the level of your carbon emissions and the changes in carbon emissions with the broad justification that the level of carbon emission tells you how far you are from basically the path that we kind of have to get to, which is net neutrality, which means that, you know, if we think at some point we're gonna get to a, a path where we're gonna go to zero emissions, you know, are you very far from that? So you're gonna be taxed a lot or not? That's reasonable. The other one is a short-term changes in emissions. So the, the change in that, which is kind of how much progress you're making, okay? You know, Ultimately, I'm not entirely convinced about the exact way you want to interpret these two measures. They have a very stark view of how you should interpret these measures. For me, it's just proxies for climate betas in some sense. Okay. Uh, but you know, there's a strength of this approach, which is very easy to measure. Okay. So one of the things we do measure well is carbon emissions. Uh, even if it's not fully mandatory, there is a push toward disclosing that in some countries mandatory, in some countries not mandatory. But in case many, many firms. And especially the big firms are disclosing at least some of the carbon emissions. Uh, and so uh, it's easy to measure, it's pretty well measured, and it's very likely there's going to be big driver of transition. So I think, in terms of climate exposure, I think it's a pretty good proxy of your carbon tax beta. So I think it's very sensible to do. Uh, of course, it relies on the availability of disclosure data, and it is not really forward, right? Because you have a firm. Which is very polluting, but they already have a plan uh, in place to kind of cut their emissions. Well, in the case, you know, um, you, the current emission might not be a very good proxy for the true climate beta. So it's imperfect, okay? But everything in the world is imperfect, so we're going to take it as it is. The second. Oh, I yeah. was just going to ask, Stefano, is, is the way to connect this to before, is transition risk similar to what was mitigation before? Like we're saying that. These are the firms who have to bear the cost of the mitigation. Exactly. Kind of informative. I, I know you said the premium is hard to measure, but it would be informative about the appropriate discount rate for that. Correct. Uh -huh. Correct. So basically, if you take those, if you take those macro models and you add heterogeneity in firms, and you say, well, there are some firms that are more exposed to pollution and some that are not. Okay. 
So that's what the thing, the first thing you need to add to those models, right? To generate cross-section dispersion. And the second thing you need is you need a process for how that tax is distributed across firms. So if you assume that that tax is taken by from firms that are polluting, which is the reasonable thing to do, but it's not what's actually happened today, right? If that's the case, then you get these these implications here from those models. Yeah, I mean, if you if you reimburse them for the cost of uh, of cleaning up their act, then it wouldn't really show up. Um, right. So exactly, so it depends. So it has on to be a redistribution. Um, yeah. Right, and you know this actually is very interesting because it affects kind of many other contexts. For example, right. So you might think that going back to a question about insurance and real estate, right? In the real estate, you think that it's the prices of houses are exposed to the to the to the floods, for example, they should be. Uh, they should be uh, reflecting these risks, right? They should have high discount rates. But if the government is say is implicitly saying, if things get really bad, I'm going to build the seawall and I'm going to tax the collectivity, yeah, then it's the taxes in the inland that are going to pay for that, right? And right. so it really, this really relies on the fact that we're going to put a carbon tax, so we're going to tax more. Yeah, the, the net cost is going to be borne by those that need more. Yeah. And uh, final question on the in the in the previous part, like the risk premiums for mitigation and damages seem like they were, they were kind of related, right? Because one is- Great uh, question. But here, because we're a little bit more reduced form, you you think they might they could be thought of as separate in this literature? Or? So this is something that is kind of a folk theory in some sense. So like, you know, everyone realizes it, but there's not a lot of actual work doing that, mm -hmm. which is the following. In some sense, there is a relation between these two, right? Because if, in a sense, the government actions, they're going to be, you know, the government is going to tax in response to the climate getting worse, right? Yeah. If the climate got better, they will not tax, and there's feedback effect. If they tax, hopefully the climate gets better. So yeah. there's a relation between the two where the ultimate net effect is not, uh, is not entirely clear, okay? Most likely they're, very, they're positively correlated. In practice, it's just very, very hard to, to check the price of one control for the other because we don't have very good measures of both. Mm -hmm to begin with. And so I don't think there's a lot of very credible evidence of, oh, I can capture the premium of, of the part of one which is orthogonal to the other one. But you could even, you could easily write a model where the two are perfectly correlated, yeah. right? And so when you're capturing one, you're really implicitly capturing the other. One thing that is very different is that in a sense, the carbon, the transition risk is very immediate, right? It's something the firms are experiencing right now, the short. Yeah. Right? The climate risk in a sense is a very long-term phenomenon. So you can think of, in a sense, you can think of transition risk as the short-term manifestation of the long-term risk in this world, right? So I don't think there's a paper doing this. I think kind of people are thinking about this, but I don't think there's a, I mean, I think you could write a model that does these kind of things. Um, yep. um, yeah, so there's a question I see now in the chat. Is this most about CO2 emissions? So uh, there are many aspects of this, uh, of this entire kind of externalities, right? This obviously this can can be thought about in any kind of world with many other types of externalities. Uh, I actually um, I'm going to talk at the end about uh, biodiversity risk, which is another aspect of the which is not climate change is related to climate change. Um, let me say the following: that as you see, as you already can start seeing, there is actually a pretty big disconnect between the macro side and the the reduced from side. And so right now, the reduced from side is, is exploring all sorts of externalities, exploring biodiversity risk, exploring climate risk. The, uh, is, you know, for example, it's exploring migration risk, right? So geopolitical risk. And then in the macro side, you know, it's very, you know, it's very uh, disconnected from the reduced from side, from empirical work. And so there is, you know, there's an, extra, there's an environmental externality which could be aimed. Okay, so I think really the where we have to go as a profession is going to be to try to better integrate the two. Okay, so the bottom line is in the macro world is more about more abstract models. In the reduced from world, there's been work in a bunch of other uh, domains. Okay, I hope this answers your question. And then uh, there's the other another approach which is not due to based on carbon emissions. There's another approach to measuring transition risk, which instead is uh, using textual analysis. And uh, basically, textual analysis is just saying, you know, can I use what the firm is saying, for example, in their earnings calls, about how, how they perceive their position in respect to carbon taxation, technological risk, and so on, is. And so they use this kind of, le, le, you know, um, uh, word frequency and this kind of uh, machine learning methods to kind of extract 
some measure of risk exposure at individual firm level, and they also check the pricing of this. Okay, which of course it, it gives you more nuanced answers, right? Is potentially even more manipulable, right, by firms because they can actually control the narrative, right? Uh, but uh, uh, but it has the advantage is more nuanced than just pure carbon emission. And um, just to give you some evidence of this from the data, okay, I'm going to talk about uh, really one paper, okay, which is this Boston Kaspersky paper. Uh, it's it's nice because they get carbon emissions from a very large cross section of firms. They have like fifteen thousand firms, and covering international markets too. The time period is short, okay, two thousand and five, two thousand and twenty. I think they 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 updated it, uh, but um, but it's a short time period. There's nothing to do, right? We don't just have a lot of data for this. And what do you do? I'm just going to give you one example of what this kind of exercise does. So you probably know that there are three types of carbon emissions: the scope one, scope two, and scope three. What is the meaning of that? In brief, is basically if you have uh, a company, scope one emissions is what the company directly emits in the atmosphere. In a sense, that's all you need to know if you want to put a carbon tax, right? But you, you are in a second best world, you can put a tar carbon tax. You may be want, you may care about other types of emissions. You may care about, for example, the emission associated with energy use in the production. The scope two. And scope three, you could, which is an even broader uh, set of emissions, is all the emissions that are associated with all the uh, use and production upstream and downstream of the, the, the chain. Okay, so it's all the emissions that come in, the, in your supply chain and all the emissions related to the use of your product. Okay, you can imagine the scope three emissions is, is a mess, right? Because go and calculate like all the way down the, the chain how people are using your product, all the way up to the beginning of the supply chain how much emissions have been uh, emitted. So scope three emissions are very badly measured. There's no kind of consensus of what's the right measure. There's no even a regulatory push really. There's minimal regulatory pressure to disclose them because it's just so hard. Scope one and two are actually much better measured because you can go at the plant level and really see you know, what are you producing. We know how much emissions are associated with different industrial processes. You can actually measure, okay? So the bottom line is right now you have pretty good data on scope one and two. And then you do a cross-sectional regression, basically regress returns or excess returns onto a bunch of characteristics of the firm plus the firm emissions. And what you find, you find what they find is that indeed you can see the in log emissions of scope one, two, and three, uh, they're associated with higher returns, okay? This is consistent with the, with the green premium, right? With the idea that these gamma betas are associated with a uh, high uh, risk premium. Now, Here's where I want to make, make a point about the connection with the macro model. These numbers are very, very hard to interpret in a macro model. So what is 0 0.11, right? What is the, so what is the slope, the compensation per unit of risk that gets associated with these, uh, with these empirical estimates? It's very hard to go back and match to the actual model because to understand it, you need to understand the, the margin of the gamma betas, right? The betas with respect to the carbon tax and so on. It's very, very hard to have a model of a macro finance climate model, which is rich enough to give you strong predictions about the magnitude of the, of the risk premium, which is why the entire literature is focusing basically on science. But I think we kind of need to go in that direction. If we're going to, need to make progress, we need to, have, to be able to use much more about what we get in the data to say something about the models. Okay, we're just not there yet. Seems a little odd that the controlling for book to market. Like I would have expected these stocks to have, you know, higher book to market ratios. So it's a little yeah, yeah. And so they actually have a discussion but... on this. Okay. And that, uh, so uh, I I forgot it. So it also depends. So these these relationships. So I don't have the slide here, but they have a slide. They do exactly what you want, which is they they check your emission as a function of uh, of your size. And then the sign of this relation actually flips when you control for the industry. I forget exactly how it works. I don't know the details, but they talk about this in the paper. Okay. Um, but yes, so basically this is all controlling for size. It says controlling for size, the uh, the the more and also controlling for industry, which what they do in the right side of the graph. By the way, they didn't say the more polluting firms uh, uh, are. Um, the more polluting firms have higher risk premium. Okay, but the relation between the emissions and the uh, and the and the size actually depends on whether you control or not for industry. Yeah. 
Okay, and you see something similar with changes. Okay, so whether you 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 control, so you, you measure carbon emission in levels changes, you get similar results. Again, my view is just that these are proxies, different types of proxies for your climate data. I don't know if I am willing to make very strong statements about their exact interpretation, but there is us going in that direction. But again, my worry with this is that we're doing all this in a very short time period where there was a big, there were kind of very large shocks in this space, right? So, you know, take it with a very long salt. Wouldn't that have gone the other way? Maybe I'm missing your point. Like where? Yeah. So yeah, I, oh. I see what you're saying. So okay. this is a period where, in fact, green industry actually did very well. And so uh -huh. there's another paper by Lubov Pasto that basically yeah, exactly. If you do, um, if you construct a green minus brown factor, and you basically sort by some different measure of ESG or E score, yeah, uh, and you don't control for industry, then you get the opposite result. Yeah. Okay. So in this space, unfortunately, exactly because of little data, a lot of it depends on what you control for. Because, for example, what Rubo sh showed is a lot of this green effect is very correlated with value, right? So then do you want to control for what happens to value or you don't want to control? You, you see, like, it's uh, it's a short sum. So I think it's uh, my view of this issue is basically a lot of these results are driven by the fact that we don't have a lot of data. So when you add a few controls, the results can flip. That's my interpretation, okay? But you guys can be free to to build your own interpretation. But which is, by the way, why I have actually not in my own papers I've not looked at this primo at all because I, I would not feel very comfortable. Questions? Yeah, questions? Okay. So now there's really not a lot more that can be done in terms of car uh, or transition risks. It's just not very entirely clear how you would measure it. Uh, Physical climate risks are uh, different in the sense that you sometimes can identify some niche assets that are indeed exposed to those climate risks. Okay, so this is um, uh, what is physical climate risk, right? Is the risk that coming from the fact that weather uh, weather is changing, and this is an effect on the actual production process. Rising sea level, you know, if your plant or house is on the coast will be flooded, it's not great. Uh, changing precipitations affects agriculture, for example. Wildfires affect a lot of things. Uh, directly heat shocks. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, pandemics can be driven by changing the ecosystem. And, um, you know, and so there's a bunch of, in different assets you can imagine are differentially exposed to the different physical risks. So the, the empirical literature on this front, what it has done is basically look for um, um, look for specific assets and specific risks which we have a good prior that should be affecting this asset class. Okay, so the same paper we did was kind of a bit of an eclectic paper, but the same paper we did the term structure of common housing and the model, we also try to estimate the sensitivity of housing to, uh, to climate risks because, you know, we we're focused on housing. We want to say, look, housing is indeed exposed to climate risks. So what did we do is we said we wanted to do a reduced form exercise trying to understand uh, if you take two houses that are on the coast, but one is more exposed to the other, do we see that the climate risk is reflected in lower prices, which is the same as saying this is affected by higher discomfort. Okay. So, um, okay, so what do we do? We take a bunch of uh, four, we take four coastal states, okay, the two Carolinas, New Jersey and Florida, and we geocode every transaction of houses into uh, whether it's exposed to the six feet sea level rise, which is kind of the, a bad scenario in this projection. Okay, so this is just to give you an example. This is um, downtown Miami. And basically you can see this uh, shaded, light, shaded area. This is where if the, six, if the sea level rises by six feet, by 2100, 2100, then uh, the red houses will be flooded below the water and the green houses will not. This correlates with whether it, whether it's on the beach or not, but there's also some other variation. Like for example, there are like, you know, there are islands and there are like highways that give you some protection and stuff like that. So um, in an ideal world, the easiest exercise you could do is you could ask, look, if I take these red houses, and I look at the greenhouses, do I see that red houses are cheap, right? That's a simple exercise. It doesn't make any sense. You want to find that, of course, in the data. 
Because if you've been to Miami, these houses are much nicer than these houses, right? Because you have the view, you have access to the beach. So you can do this kind of simple difference. So our idea was uh, that uh, we could maybe instead do a diff in diff. Okay, so what? how does a diff in diff work? We say, well, something S must change, something must change over time. And what must change over time must change something that we think affects the price or the discount rate, but shouldn't affect the actual physical uh, property, right? Because we want to figure out climate, uh, discount rate effect. So what do we do in practice? We build a climate change awareness index. Uh, we, we, we take from Zillow all the real estate listings and we build in every location and in every quarter uh, we build a measure of how much these real estate listings are talking about climate risk. For, for example, do they mention flood? Do they mention the FEMA, uh, which is the agency that deals with the emergencies, or do they do they not? So this is a distrib geographic distribution of this attention index. So you see that in the coastal areas, as you might expect, there is much more talk in the real estate indexes about flood, for example, than in the in inland. But you also have time variation. You see this the index across time for a given location. There are periods where people talk, pay more attention or less attention to climate risk. Okay. And so then we do a different diff. We don't ask whether the exposed houses are cheaper than a non-exposed house because we know they're ex more expensive. We're gonna ask when people become more worried about climate risk, does the price of the uh, exposed houses drop more than the price of the non-exposed houses? Okay. So that's our diff in diff. And basically, in other words, one way to think about this, we're regressing low prices of the houses on a bunch of controls. And then we have an indicator for whether you're in a flood zone, right, which is the red houses. And then we have the interaction uh, with this attention. Index. So, so if indeed uh, house prices reflect climate risk, we'd expect this coefficient to be negative. That house prices that are red, they're exposed to climate risk, they drop more in response to the increase in attention compared to the others. Oops. Any any idea what drives the attention? Is it, uh, you know, there's a hurricane or something? Okay, I'm just so we don't know exactly that. So that's actually a concern, right? Because in some sense, what would we worry about is, is that maybe this drop in prices is not because people get worried about climate risk, it's because it was a hurricane, the hurricane destroyed the house, and the house now is less and, and is less valuable, and we're also more worried about fuel climate. We're also worried about climate risk. So that would be kind of a confounding effect, right? So our way to control for that is exactly what I was going to talk next, because which is we can do it with rents. Right? We can say when people are more worried about climate risk, so these scenarios that we're capturing here, do we also see that rents are decreasing? And the answer is no. We don't know why they're increasing either. Okay, but we're certainly not decreasing. So the point is, uh, the point here is, we don't think it's due this increase in attention due to some devastating event that has big effect on on the actual properties. So we really think about the forward looking component of prices, which is the kind of discount rate. Now, why, where is this coming from? This I, I don't exactly know. Okay, it's a, it's interesting to study what are the where the perspective of risks are coming from, and I don't have the answer to that. But it's interesting. I mean, I would have guessed like a heat wave has a lot to do with it, and that doesn't necessarily right. directly damage the house, but it makes for a lot of headlines. Exactly. So it could very well be that. I mean, we know, and I'm going to talk about that later. Also, that heat waves do really change people's perceptions. The point is, I don't know. You know, here I think. You see here the variation across geography is very important. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if for heat waves, we're going to kind of really capture the variation across counties, right, or across zip codes, but maybe it can account for the aggregate variation. We, we did not check that. Yeah. OK. Any more questions? OK. So next, I'm going to think about, uh, I'm going to uh, talk about other asset classes. So. Basically, how do we interpret this result? This is a beta effect. We're just saying when there is something that affects climate risk, we see prices change. We didn't say anything about the discount rate, the average return, the risk premium. We're not going to talk about that. Now, since this paper, people have done this on many other asset classes. Okay. So, in fact, there's been other papers looking at very similar exercises on, re on real estate. And there's been 
Uh, other papers are looking at, uh, for example, municipal bonds, which are nice because municipal bonds are financed by local taxes, right? Which again, are very exposed to geographic risks, right? If the hurricane comes and destroys the, the city, you know, you're gonna need to tax to the people to reconstruct, the municipal bonds might be affected. Um, you can do it equities, right? I'm gonna talk about that later. You can do it corporate bonds and so on. So I'm gonna show you just one result for a, of a recent paper by Acharya and co-authors, uh, which has looked at, has basically done a similar diff in deep on municipal bonds and corporate bonds and equities, okay? And just very briefly, what is the variation they look here? They look at heat risk. So they look at across counties, is a cross county variation, no country, county in the US, they measure exposure to heat waves in different counties, and they measure year by year the discount associated with municipal bonds that come from counties which are more risky versus less risky. When I say they do a different deep, it's because they're in, what they're looking at is the variation over time. You see, these are the discounts, okay? This is the opposite in terms of sign, right? In respect to what I said before, but these ending municipal bonds are cheaper when they come from more risky municipalities. Their different diff is because they say, look, attention to climate change has really picked up in the last 10 years. And so they say, look, you can see that the effect due to the heat risk has really picked up and you see it in municipal bonds now, but you didn't see it earlier when people didn't care, okay? Which, which they interpret as saying, this is not due to some like random macro variation. It's really that people are paying attention to climate risk now, and that's why we see price thing. And the same you can see in corporate bonds and equities that are exposed to this heat risk for, again, given a, a geographic location. Again, you didn't see much before 2010. You see the results uh, much stronger today. And they do this also, I don't have it here, but they do also for different types of risks, like hurricane risk and cold risk and so on. And they find very little. So what they're saying, going kind of back to what Alexi was saying, that indeed it seems like heat risk is a very important uh, driver or the perception of climate risk, okay? Uh, which is going to be relevant for what I'm going to say in a little bit also. Okay. So the bottom line is that by now we have a ton of evidence that there is some, that in financial market and investors are really perceiving, right, that some asset classes are exposed to climate risk and the price is at least somewhat reflect this. Just to reiterate what I said before, what we cannot answer with these exercises is, are they perceiving this correct, right? So if you look at the house in Florida, right, it's where we're, we're saying, well, it's cheaper than it would otherwise be if people ignore the climate risk, but is it cheap enough, right? We can answer this question unless we have a much more structured view of what cheap enough should be, okay? Right now, we don't have an answer. There's another side of the literature that I, I mentioned just because I worked on that, um, is, which is uh, that this perception, you kind of see reflected in prices. You also see this perception much, you know, pretty strong of the existence of these climate risks uh, and associated risk premia when you survey investors. So some work has looked at institutional investors. My own paper has looked at... at um, um, at uh, retail investors, right? These are Vanguard data. So these are is a survey of Vanguard investors. They just ask them, you know, what do you expect an ESG fund to um, to yield? You expect a return which is higher or lower than the market? They clearly perceive these funds as being different from the market. Presumably, the the this, this, the narrative would be they understand that these funds they yield they are buying either because of some moral reasons or because probably the hedge with respect to climate risk. And they, if you look at this, these are distribution of their expected returns for this fund minus the market, right? So do you think basically, if you're on the right side, you think this fund in the long run is gonna out uh, overperform the market? In the left side here, you think it's gonna underperform the market. And what you see here is um, that you, the, more, the average investor thinks it's gonna underperform the market, which is consistent with the story that this is a hedge and you wanna buy this portfolio because you think it's a hedge. Right, you're willing to pay a little more, getting lower expected returns because it's it's a hedge. Okay. You also see interestingly that this is of the over time the expected return of the market, which is about seven percent, 
and expect a return of an ESG fund, you can see that if people become more pessimistic over time. We don't really fully understand why that's the case. Okay, but uh, uh, it's also a very short time series. Okay, it's like two years of data. So, okay, so again, there's signals in the pricing that investors are perceiving these uh, risks and the pricing mean, and there are some signals in the in the survey literature that these prices are in. So I think this side of the micro data, I think is starting to give pretty clear answers, okay? And so really what, what needs to be done is to do a much better job in linking all these results with the macro model. Okay. This leads me to my last uh, section, which is hedging climate fees. So the idea is very simple, okay? Is that once you realize that there are betas, they are different across assets with respect to climate risk. So I find assets that I say, an asset that are low climate beta, then I can buy the high climate beta assets. I can, sorry, the, I can buy the low climate beta assets. I can buy the, the sell the high climate beta assets. I can build a long short portfolio. This portfolio should be a use, useful for portfolio to hedge, okay? So before I go there, which is, by the way, what the entirety of the ESG industry is doing right now, right? In this, in this, this kind of massive growth in the ESG industry, all they're doing is they're doing portfolio tilt, which is it's the same as saying, I'm going to overweight some stocks and otherweight some stocks to give me some robustness with respect to climate, climate risks. Okay. Before I go there, I want to give you, again, this is supposed to be a, a kind of more big picture kind of class. So I want to give you a bit of a uh, big picture view of the insurance markets in general, the hedging market in, in, uh, for climate risks. So suppose you're a firm, okay? Suppose you're a firm uh, that is producing, um, I don't know, gadgets and you're exporting or whatever. You're a firm in the global economy and you're worried about climate risk having an effect direct or indirect on your business, okay? Maybe because it affects your supply chain, maybe because it affects your, 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 you know, the location of establishments and so on. How do you hedge against climate risk? Right now, there are three ways to do it, okay? The first one, you can buy insurance. The second one, you can buy derivatives. And the third one, you can do these portfolio tilts. So let me, I have really one slide on each, and I know I'm gonna go into great details, but just to give you some, uh, some uh, background, okay? So first of all, there is an insurance market, okay? So first of all, some events you can directly hedge, right? If you're worried about fire, you can buy fire insurance. If you're worried about flood, you can buy fire insurance. So, the direct weather implication of climate change, they are certainly insured, okay? First point. Then there is a higher level of insurance market where these risks are then kind of sold by the insurance companies, right? So this, this insurance market is kind of spreading out the risk even more in the economy, okay? So there is a sense in which some of these risks can be hedged, but two important issues. The first is that not all risks are insure, okay? You cannot buy insurance against transition risk, for example, a carbon tax. That's a big deal. Second, and very important, you actually can't buy long-term insurance, right? Every year, if you buy insurance against anything, your car, your fire, your house insurance, your rental insurance, right? These are repriced every year. So yes, it gives you protection against one flood this year, but if the general risk increases, you're gonna be paying all that in pre. Uh, the point is you're not insured against the long-term shock, you're sure only against the short-term shocks. That's not what climate change is about. And so uh, in a sense, if insurance are repricing everything yearly, uh, they're really not getting taken off, they, they're not taking on climate risk. There's a fascinating literature that thinks about long-term and short-term insurance. There's a beautiful paper by Cochrane that talks about this, about how you can have everything decentralized with both short-term markets and long-term markets that's very far from reality, okay? In reality, you basically cannot buy long-term, let's say, uh, hurricane insurance, okay? There's just no money. Um, okay, so that's one. So insurance is kind of limited, okay? And also as a kind of a moral result that we kind of talked a little bit about before, which is ideally you want to have very, very little basis risk. And you want to have insurance, which is very, very well tailored to your own, risks, right? For example, you don't want insurance that is tied to, let's say the average flood rate in uh, Connecticut. You want something which is related to the flood in your exact area. 
But of course, then, you know, once you're fully insured, then the incentive for mitigation can really drop, right? And so the standard moral hazard will be insured. And so, and so there's a bit of a moral hazard issue with climate change as well. So there are ways to go around, right? We know how what they look like, right? You're going to accept a bit of basis risk or you're going to, you're going to do incomplete insurance, right? Or you're going to accept some basis risk. So you're going to tie the insurance to something that you can control, uh, but then it's going to make the insurance kind of look, work, look worse, okay? So this is just to say that insurance actually is a very is not a very complete market with respect to these risks and i think there's a lot of work that should be done in really understanding where are the market failures and what can we do to make markets work better okay and i think we as researchers actually have quite a bit to say about this um so that's all i have to say about insurance okay then there are derivatives derivatives actually do allow you to to hedge some uh, in some way, uh, climate, uh, the two types of, of risk, okay? So the, the climate risk and transition risk. Uh, in particular, there are something called climate uh, catastrophe bonds, okay? Which are a part of this group of securities called insurance linked securities. We shouldn't think of basically packages of a standard bond plus a trigger that is a trigger in case of disaster. Basically, the idea is, you know, rather than being just purely a bet on the disaster is bundled together with the bond. So you give me money, for example, and I accumulate, the, you know, I use the money for whatever I want. Part of it would be to kind of create a reserve fund in case of uh, a disaster strikes. But then if a disaster strikes, I actually don't have to repay you the money, right? So this is a combination of a uh, standard bond with a derivative on, uh, on catastrophe. That's one. Two, there's weather derivatives which are standard futures type or options type to the, to, the, to the weather, and three, they are common price futures, okay? And again, what can we bring as researchers to this? I think there's a lot we need to understand about how these markets work, why do they fail in some situation, why they're so small, and how can we, can we make them uh, better? So I will tell you a little bit about each of these three, because I think it's a, this is really a great area of study. Catastrophe bonds are actually, among the most promising ones, uh, the big problems are one, that they tend to be pretty short maturity. Again, three to five years is not enough to cover for the biggest problems with climate change. And then this basis risk problem of how exactly, what do you tie the payment for? Okay, so this is a case of one particular catastrophe bond. If you read this here, it says, look, what the, this deal the, uh, is providing is providing insurance, not if, the losses in a particular location or for a particular industry, for a particular firm, are particularly high, but he's saying the deal provides this compensation if estimated losses at the insurance industry level from thunderstorms and tornadoes exceed a certain amount. Okay, so here's a, a case where the trigger is not based on, for example, whether you know my own losses are particularly high, but it's whether the entire industry has particular high losses. Why again to prevent uh, to prevent moral hazard? Okay. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, variation in this uh, in this kind of contracts, but this is the kind of contract you find uh, in the day in reality, which has a big problem, which is short maturity. Okay, so again, it does not protect you from the long term climate risk. Any questions? Okay. Then the second, uh, the second uh, uh, type of derivative is on weather. And um, a, so, sorry, just to interrupt for a second. How, how who buys these? Like, can you, can you tell us more about like, like the market? So, okay, so these are small markets. Okay, and in fact, uh, there was a paper by Tomonen, right? Tomonen, exactly. Yeah. Uh, there was a huge market payment. It was actually showing that you get a lot of discount demand effects on prices because it's small market. Yes. Um, so many of these deals are issued, many of these, so many of these deals are issued by countries, for example, mm -hmm. and by uh, reinsurance companies to offload some of these risks. Mm. And then bought by hedge funds, basically. I think the hedge funds are the biggest buyers of this. So they kind of, there's hedge funds that specialize in this kind of tail risk. Uh, some hedge funds which don't specialize in tariffs, they have a small part of the business buying this because these give, tend to give very high rates. 
right? Because it's a small market. So to bear this risk, you, you know, you, people want extra compensation. So I think on average is a pretty good market to me, but you know, it's also one of these markets where so much skewness in the in the in fat tails, right? That uh, one bad year can kind of wipe out all your your profit. Gotcha. Um, okay, then there's weather derivatives, and you know, if you look at the CME, for example, they have weather derivatives. You know, they're typically, uh, for example, they're tied to the weather, they're tied to to other kind of physical uh, like rain and things like that. The problem is that they tend to be even more short term. Okay, they to be like three months. Why? Because they're used to, for example, there are farmers, the utility companies that they want to forecast, or maybe there's electricity uh, futures, for example, right? Can be used to hedge this kind of uh, variation. But this truly is about the weather, it's actually not about the climate. Now, in a sense, a weather derivative and a climate derivative are the same if you had a you know 100 year weather derivative, right? But these weather derivatives are actually like three months, six months weather derivative. So they they really cannot be used exactly as uh, as to hedge um, to hedge uh, climate risk. Okay, and so you can see all this kind of preamble was really to say, look, ultimately, if you're an investor and you want to have a portfolio, you want to have some resilience to uh, to climate risk, or if you're a firm and you want to try to basically hedge yourself in some way, it's not like you can do much more than trying to make bets using you know, ETFs and, uh, and stocks. Like there's really not much more, maybe bonds, right? So basically, uh, oh, I forgot to say this, sorry. Let me, let me go back one second. So there, is, there are derivatives for transition risk, which is carbon emissions, which is basically futures on the spot price of the trading price in the carbon trading system. So some countries, for example, Europe has an emission trading system where you can exchange permit. It's a cap and trade system, right? So the, 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 the regulator caps the number of permits that you can uh, issue in a year, right? And, and so then anybody who's in issuing needs to buy these certificates. And there's a futures market for, there's a spot market and the futures market for those certificates. And you can use the future market to basically hedge, right? That's kind of the value of the transition risk. If the government's come and tax a lot the, or reduce the cap, right? Then the price of these emissions will be high. So if you have bought them before or you bought the futures, you will make money and be hedged, right? So you can use futures on this to hedge against uh, transition risk. So that's another very interesting uh, market uh, to start. Okay, then, uh, but, but then back to the point of the, of the alternatives, you know, we don't really have a lot of alternatives. And so portfolio adjustments are very imperfect for reasons I'll show you later. But in a sense, the best we can do it. That's why this entire you know, ESG industry has been so successful because that's kind of, it's imperfect, but that's, that's the best we can do. Now, suppose that you wanna hedge climate risk using stocks. How would you do it? So the most natural way to do it is to use a meeting portfolio approach, okay? So how would you do, for example, how would you, how would you hedge it? You would say, well, first of all, I'm not trying to hedge weather risk. Right? I'm not trying to hedge tomorrow's rains. I'm trying to hedge very long-term climate risk. How can I hedge very long-term climate risk with, with a kind of dynamic, with a portfolio equity? Well, one thing you can do, which is a lesson from basically the, the options literature, is that you can dynamically rebalance your portfolio to hedge the news of our long-term risk. Right? So if every day I have a portfolio that rises in value, when I get bad news about long-term climate, Right then, you know, we don't got, we're not gonna get from now to 100 years in one step, right? We're gonna go down some path, you know, one day we're gonna see, oh, wow, it's worse than we thought. Then the, three days later, oh, wow, it's even worse than we thought and so on. So we're gonna get to a really bad path in the climate. We're gonna get there by getting bad news in a sequence, right? A string of bad news. And if I have a portfolio that I rebalance so that every day it's hedging me against those bad news, then at the end of these 100 years, when the climate is actually a disaster, I will have a portfolio that has very much appreciated in value. That's kind of the intuition. So we need a model of news about climate risk. And uh, once we have this news, we can use a standard making portfolio approach to buy stocks that appreciate when there's bad news in climate risk, say stocks that they go down in value when there's bad news in climate risk, and then rebalance this portfolio over time. This portfolio is going to be your portfolio. Okay, so it's a it's Conceptually, it's very, very simple problem. 
the implementation is hard. And so what I'm going to talk about today is a couple of papers I've been thinking about uh, that are trying to implement these, uh, these things, these portfolios. Questions? OK. So the first portfolio is uh, this first portfolio. The first paper is very simple, is, um, is uh, this paper here. It really was a proof of concept to say, look, you can do it in some way or another. OK? So the first point is you need to build a measure of climate news. Right, so how do you build a measure of climate news? What's what's news? Right, is changing expectations about the long term dam the long term damage to the ground. That's impossible to really estimate. Okay, so we took a different approach. We said, look, maybe we can use news as what's captured by the newspaper. If people change their views about the climate, hopefully the newspapers will talk about that. Okay, so how do I identify these news from the newspaper? We use a, a very simple uh, text parsing procedure. You can even call it machine learning procedure. Uh, this does the following. We generate a, a climate change vocabulary by uh, basically reading a lot of text from uh, white papers that scientists use to communicate to laymen, lay people, uh, IPCC, the EPA, NASA, and so on. So this is not purely scientific language, right? This is language supposed to communicate with a person who's not a specialist. Then we, say, we ask in each day, how much is the Wall Street Journal using that language? OK, so we're going to add a measure that, that varies day by day, which says how much is the Wall Street Journal talking about that? And then we have a different measure that say, is it Wall Street Journal talking with a negative sentiment or a positive sentiment about, about this? And, um, and uh, this is going to give us an aggregate time series. And then we're going to be the making portfolio. So there are many ways to do the making portfolio. The way we say is to say, look, we're going to try with a portfolio sorted by the e-scores and we're gonna see if by chance it actually does hedge this news and in fact it does. Okay. So it's gonna be a portfolio that is most you can think of basically say I'm gonna go long you know green companies and short brown companies and then gonna evaluate the hedging uh, the hedging uh, auto sample hedging uh, performance of this portfolio. Okay. As an example this is the Wall Street Journal measure in the paper, you can see that it spikes precisely when there are events where people talk about climate change, you know, the Copenhagen meeting, the Paris Agreement, where is it? I don't see now, but there's the Paris Agreement somewhere. It was okay. on the right. Sorry? It, it's the second spike from the right. Okay. Ah, Paris Echo, thank you, it will come here. <laughs> and then there was, when Trump withdraws from the Paris Agreement, and then uh, we have the, you know, when the IPC report come out, right, if you have the newspaper talk about that, that's time where people, people do update their views about climate change. So this one, um, okay. So you can see, and then we, yeah, I don't plot it here, but we do have a measure um, of, uh, of, uh, of a signed measure where people, it's coming kind of when people talk in a negative way about climate change. So you have a target, this is the target of the hedge. And then we do what we do always in funds. We build, build the mini portfolio, we ask historically what stocks have gone up in value when these measures spike. We're gonna buy those stocks, we're gonna sell stocks that go down in value, and that's our tick portfolio. Okay. It's uh, monthly here or, or daily. You could okay, it. so we have daily, so the text measure is daily, mm -hmm. but we do in this paper we do the answer at the monthly level. So we use monthly correlations. Daily they, these daily measures are very noisy, so we aggregate them to the Monthly okay. level because apparently, you know, one newspaper talks about one thing one day, then another newspaper on the same day, just mm. the same thing the next day. Right? It's kind of difficult to do the timing exactly at the daily level. Mm -hmm. Monthly is a bit is a bit less noise. Yeah. I mean, you can understand it's not perfect. Okay. There's a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of things you can you can decide to do in a different way. And you, uh, you know, and maybe you can you will improve in many dimensions. And I tell you, in fact, after like there's been many papers. Since we wrote this paper, they come out with much better measures than ours. More sophisticated, more sophisticated machine learning methods, and really try to disentangle transition risk versus um, versus uh, physical risk and different types of news. You know, global summit news and other types of news. Like this has been improved on many dimensions, and this was meant to be original. This was part of this early RFS. Uh, uh, you know, this this, this issue that RFS were. 
yeah. where you know where basically they invited proposal. So it was really meant to be a proof of concept. It can be very much improved. Um, seems to be tilting toward the transition risk, right? These, these are mostly like right. policy reforms and so on, as opposed to like you know climate. So Direct you're right. So you're right. So disasters. our original view was we're not going to distinguish it. To in fact, we got exactly the comment from Lars Hansen saying, "Look, you know, ultimately, you should probably think of this as transition risk." Our view is future work would be able to distinguish, right? For example, with machine learning, you can say we can try to extract which tech through text truth is about you know long-term temperatures and which is about transition risk. Now you know it's a little bit. Um, it, it turns out to be harder than, than, than you think, partly because they're correlated, as we mentioned before, and partly because there's just so much noise in, this, in these procedures. So in the next paper that I'm going to talk about now, we did try to distinguish these two by using measures that people proposed that distinguish the two, but we didn't have much success in some sense. Like in the sense that it's not very clear, right, really what is the distinction. I'll talk about that later. Um, okay. Any, let me stop for one second. Any questions on this? Okay. So uh, this is the last thing I want to talk about. This is the uh, a, a kind of build. It's a paper that builds on that, but tries to use more information. Because you see, the problem with building a making portfolio based on a target like that is that you have few years of data, you know, 10, 20 years of data. It's really not a lot of data to be the making portfolio. Right? And if you think that only in the last 10 years, stocks actually reflect common information, then you'll be the making portfolio based on 10 years, right? That's really, really little. And so we had this idea in this paper where we say, look, maybe ultimately, what is a hedging portfolio? Hedging portfolio is a portfolio where I select stocks they want to buy because they go up when climate change materializes. I don't need to only do this by looking at the actual realization of climate risk. Maybe this other information is informative about that. The idea of this, of this paper is to use what we call quantity-based, a quantity-based approach. We say the following. Imagine you only have one time period, so you can't build a meeting portfolio. But in this time period, you see that some investors get really worried about climate risk and other investors don't. And you see that all those investors get worried about climate risk, they buy test and the other investors don't. We learn there's elasticity between worry about climate risk and buying Tesla. If that's a regular pattern, then I would buy Tesla thinking that if then climate news arrives, and then as a reaction, people get worried about climate risk and they all buy Tesla, then my Tesla will go up in value. Okay, I have a nice graphical representation of this, driven again, like we discussed before, by heat shocks. Right, so suppose in Oregon, maybe because there's heat wave in Oregon, in one period, an invest investors experience a heat wave, and they all go and buy Tesla, and then I see next year that people in Illinois they experience a heat wave, they get worried about climate risk, and they buy Tesla, and maybe in Florida they don't experience any, any heat wave, but they still get worried about climate change, and they buy Tesla, then I should buy Tesla even if I detect this just from the trading response. Because then when climate actually comes in, everyone is going to get worried because it's an aggregate event when climate news comes in, everyone is going to buy they get Tesla and I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to, the price of Tesla is going to go up. That's the idea. And so we actually try to implement this. Again, the implementation is very tricky. So what do we do? We focus on mutual fund managers, okay? And we look at how they trade because we can get the proxy by looking at the holdings every quarter. And we try to, to have two measures of why when people trade in response to a change in their beliefs about climate change. So one way is to say they experience a heat shock, and because of the heat shock, they get more worried, and we see how they trade in response to a heat shock. And the other is that we can see, even that without experiencing any heat waves, they can see that they change their views about climate change because they write about climate change in their disclosure to invest. So one day you see that a fund has added all this language about climate change to, or other climate risks to their disclosures, where you think, okay, this is a fund that this quarter has experienced some climate concerns. Let's see how they trade. And that's how we learn. So our exercise will be the following. We're going to find in a panel of mutual funds over the last 10 years, funds that are treated 
because they're either experiencing heat shock in their location where they're located, or they're experiencing a, a belief shock because they disclose they're worried about climate change now. And we think of these as treated funds. And then we're gonna compare what they buy with what non-treated funds are, which are everybody else. And we're trying to compare funds in the same quarter. So in the same quarter, what do treated funds do compared to funds that are not treated? We're gonna ask what industries do they buy uh, what industry do they overweight? And that's kind of the same what we are doing with our test example before, okay? Then I'm gonna buy the same industries with the idea that then when everyone is hit by the same shock, they will all believe, they will all behave like the traded funds that will all go and buy the same kind of stocks, okay? So I will skip some of the details of this, okay? But that's basically, that's basically the idea, okay? So you basically run a regression of how they trade, which is an active change in their portfolio, onto quarter fixed effects and this treatment value, right? Are you treated, are you experiencing right now and changing your beliefs about climate change? Yes, let's see how you're trading. So this beta is high for those industries you're buying and my hedging portfolio has weights exactly equal to those betas, okay? So I think the intuition is very, very simple. It's just a different way to pick which stocks go on the top and which stocks go on the bottom. One very interesting uh, result that we have is the following. These shocks, uh, if you look at these different types of shocks that we have, the shocks to the heat, we have different definition of heat shocks, which I'm not gonna talk about today. And we have this disclosure shock. They actually very low correlation because the kind of fund that experiences one type of heat shock is not the same kind of fund that experiences a different type of heat shock. And it's not the same kind of fund that disclosures, that discloses Heat, they disclose this kind of climate concerns. They really, they capture different sources of variation, mostly correlations are very low. But if you look at the portfolios, the, the, the way they trade in response to these shocks, these are actually quite similar. So this is a correlation table for the betas at the industry level. So which stocks they buy and which stocks they sell. So we end up with actually very similar hedging portfolios even if you're starting from different shocks, which I think is a good sign that you know that there's some sort of pattern in how people behave when they become more worried about climate risk, independent of what's the source of their different uh, different behavior. Okay, and we are gonna target. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you how this hedging measure hedges different measures, not just our old Wall Street Journal measure, but a bunch of other ones. Some of these, like the one Brian was. I'm not sure if he's working on still on this, but at least he was working on a paper trying to use machine learning to split between transition risk and physical risk. So that he has two measures, some other measure of common nude. Okay, I'm gonna just look at all the targets. I'm gonna ask, how well does my hedging portfolio hedge all the targets? And here's the answer. Okay, so these are our four hedging portfolios, so each built using a different measure of belief shock. And these are the correlation that you get out of sample correlation which each tag. Okay, so to give a simple example, look at this blue measure blue measure here. It's an expanded version of a Wall Street Journal measure. It says that our first portfolio, that is buying and selling stocks based on uh, heat shocks that produce a lot of agricultural uh, insurance payments, has a 20% out of sample correlation with the shock, with the client new shock being by R. Okay, now here's where I wanna stop a little bit. And I want to think about magnitudes, okay? So is a 20% correlation high or low in terms of actual hedging a risk, right? If you were building a, um, if you're building a hedging portfolio using a future, you get 100% correlation, right? You probably hedge a target. A 20% correlation is very low, okay? It means that there's a huge amount of the variation you actually can't catch. Right, so this portfolio will somewhat be tilted towards climate risk, but while you're doing this portfolio, you're picking up a lot of other stuff, basically, which is not climate risk. Now you might say this is useless, maybe, but it's important to clarify that if you do the same exercise using macro variables, you get the same result. If you use stock prices to hedge macro risks, you get similarly low R squares. It's it basically it's just very difficult to hedge real variables. I mean, I wrote a different paper, which is I didn't cite here, but 
with the Cheng Shiu on being hedging portfolios. And we document this hedging R squares for a lot of macro variables. They're all very low. Why? Because stocks are driven by a lot of things which have nothing to do with macro economy. And, um, and you know, the premium for macro risks are, you know, very little reflected in, in, in financial stocks and so on, right? And so, um, this, you know, it's not, it's difficult to hedge these macro shops and it's difficult to hedge counties. It's not the more difficult than it is for macro shops. It's just difficult in general. I mean, the, the climate news innovation also has noise in it. That would Exactly, exactly. Then there's noise. Exactly. The yeah. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, the fact that all these climate news are difficult to hedge, tells you that it's, you know, noise is probably very big in all, but in a sense, they probably, it's just not capturing everything that we clearly what people care about, but also these portfolios have a lot of stuff moving around, right? Maybe some market specific stuff is not diversifiable. And so, uh, and so it fact affects things here too. Okay, so it's just a difficult exercise. And I'm sure that more work in this literature can do a lot more here. If you don't want to follow our procedure, what can you do? Well, you don't have many options, right? What you can do, you can take bets kind of arbitrarily, right? So here's four bets you can do. There are reasons. Why? You can buy PVD, which is a clean energy fund. You can say, look, I think that you don't need to do all this long short stuff. I just buy PVD. It's a clean energy ETFs. And I think that if the economy, if the climate does bad, this thing will probably do well. Or it is a hedge against transition. Or you could say, maybe I should just short traditional energy. That's also pretty reasonable, right? Because traditional energy, which is mostly fossil fuels, they are, they are going to get very affected by that carbon. Or you can do what's called a short strand asset portfolio, short traditional energy and coal. Or you can do a long short E-score portfolio like we did in the other paper. If you ask me, I would say these are all kind of equivalent. Unfortunately, their hedging performance is very different. So some of them do well. You see, they hedge very well all of the measures. And some of them do terribly. And they hedge actually negative of some correlation of all these measures. Okay. So I think that if you have a very strong view of what's the right approach, what you should buy and sell, then you should definitely use it. But keep in mind, you might get it very wrong and you might actually get even the sign wrong. The other approach is a standard making portfolio approach, which is just a time series approach, right? You project the uh, returns, uh, you project the climate target onto a bunch of portfolios. Those, they tend to have very noisy performance because the data is, is very short, you have 10 years of data, okay? So there are many valid approaches. Our approach is a statistical approach, but it is the advantage that it doesn't only use time series information, it also uses cross-sectional information, okay? Which is a little more, it's a little less known. That said, I think there's a lot more work to be done. And effectively, one way to think about this is that what the industry is doing with all these ESG funds is trying to figure out how to do this problem, okay? How to figure out correctly what are the stocks that will benefit from climate change and what are the stocks that they don't, okay? This is more like a group of funds, okay? We have five minutes. I know it's been a lot of talking from my side. Let me just close with one slide on directions for research. I think I already talked a lot about what I think is really needed on the, on the modeling side. First, I think all this work that Lars is doing on uncertainty needs to be greatly expanded. There's a lot more stuff to be done there, especially in quantifying this uncertainty, the uncertainty and in build and in, make, in linking the quantitative models to all this empirical work that we've been doing. They're too disconnected. The other work, which I think is very interesting, which is, you know, there's some paper, for example, Harrison Hong's paper on that, which is, what is the optimal second best policy, right? It's easy to figure out the first best. Uh, Lasse uh, Pedersen also has another paper on this, very recent paper on this. Um, it's very easy to figure out what's the first best, but once you go to a second best, you have many potential instruments. You can, you know, subsidize green investments. You can uh, tax polluting companies. You can, uh, you know, you can, uh, um, I don't know, you can try to, to give subsidy for different things. You can uh, subsidize uh, green energy and you can uh, tax just green energy instead of pollution, right? You can do a lot of different things. So what is the optimal policy? Well, you know, that, that's an open question. It depends on the, on the set of instruments that you have. And I think Harrison's paper is very nice in that he really shows the dependence of the instruments you use. Uh, there's another, uh, there's another uh, 
there's another set of open questions in the measurement and pricing of climate risks. I think we're still in search for better measures of climate exposures, which are all very noisy. And uh, we also, I think it would be, we still are not very clear about ultimately, if we do believe that this, this climate risk is price, does this pricing effect actually end up having a real effect, right? Because when you have a price effect on the price of bonds and stocks, you're going to affect the cost of capital. But how and why does the cost of capital then kind of trickle down to the actual decisions? Kelly and some other, Kelly Schwen, some other have a paper on this. Uh, Jusan Misberg and a different paper on, 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 the, on whether this is a relevant channel. That's, I think, another important area of study. Uh, there's a bunch of questions on the hedging of climate risk. How do we design good derivatives? How do we make those markets I talked about before work better? How do we improve the hedging portfolio techniques that I, I just showed you? And then one, there's a quick page, one of the questions that popped up before. You know, we talk about climate risk as if it's one type of risk. We talk about climate risk, maybe is it distinguishing transition risk and, and physical risk, but there's many other aspects of the economy. They are kind of similar, but they're different. Okay. So for example, I've been I have a recent paper on biodiversity risk, which is basically the risk to the ecosystem, which turns out to be interactive with climate risk, but being actually quite different. You could have you could have a firm which is very exposed to ecosystem risk without being exposed to climate risk, or it might be contributing to a risk to the ecosystem. So the you know the, the entirety of the of the system of the um of the species without actually affecting the climate, but the climate might deteriorate, might deteriorate the biodiversity risk. So there is an entire set. And then, for example, pandemic risk is also related, right? Because there's changes to the climate. They might affect the evolution of pathogens, which actually may be in the interaction with, with you know, how this interact with you, right? And so all these are different versions of risk. They're all related, and we need to study them all, I think, and try to incorporate them all together. And then. The last thing which I think is incredibly important to think about is geoengineer. Okay. This is this point that has been made by Weizmann, uh, at least in a book, for, I don't know if in any other places, uh, which is called Climate Shock, that says, look, ultimately, geoengineering might actually end up being very cheap. So rather than having the problem then that nobody wants to intervene to mitigate climate risk because you have a positive, you have a negative externality, with geoenge geoengineering, you have the opposite externality, right? With geoengineering, there might be some small country might have, might have the incentive to just, for example, throw a bunch of like particles in the atmosphere to cool down the, at the atmosphere. They may be very cheap to do, but has then spillover effects on the rest of the world, right? Like the same about the volcano does, right? The volcano releases this particle, it cools down the planet. The cost of doing that might be small compared to the potential uh, benefits and costs for the entire world. So the, there the incentive system is very different. That's something we need to understand better. Or of course other technological solutions. Okay, so this is a very very rich field of research. I try to give a very big picture view, really mostly to get you interested in this. Uh, I'm I've been seeing a lot of evolutionary research over the last few years. I'm very much looking forward to seeing your your papers on this as well. And maybe if you have, I have I have reference at the end. Uh, to cover most of these papers, if you're interested, I will. If you're, there's something at the inside, you can just send me an email, and that's it. Well, any questions? Yeah, and then any questions, right? Before I conclude. Well, thank you, Stefano. I mean, this was just fantastic, and I think um, not just interesting, but super important. Um, so, uh, yeah, I second, and I, I like how you ended on uh, suggestions for, for for topics because I think I, I think that would be very useful. Um, please, uh, everyone, just join me in thanking uh, Stefano uh, for talking to us today, and uh, also thank you all for uh, coming to uh, the Macrofinance Summer School. It's uh, another one uh, for the history books at this point. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot as I think I did. Um, I, um, all the videos uh, will be posted on YouTube in the next week or so. And uh, in addition, you've already received the slides. Uh, so um, uh, hopefully these will uh, motivate your own future research. Um, thank you all. Have a great weekend. Thank you. Thanks, Alexi. Bye, Bye. Stefan. Thanks again.